gonna heat your mite up, so don't say nothing. Scamia County Redevelopment Agency regular meeting June 3rd, 2021, 9.01 a.m. Please turn your cell phone to vibrate silent or to offsetting. Board of County Commissioner allows any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman. Is there proof of publication? Um, yes, this meeting has been properly published with Pensacola News Journal on May 29th. 2021. Thank you. Are there any speakers for public forum? No. Thank you. Technical and public service consent agenda. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, first one is the recommendation concerning the Community Redevelopment Agency meeting minutes for May 8, May 6, 2021 for your review and approval. We'll Move. entertain a motion. Move the meeting. Second. Please vote. That passes four in favor with Commissioner Underhill off the dais. Budget and finance. All right, on the budget and finance, our first recommendation is concerning the residential rehab grant funding and lead agreement. There, there's an A and B for your review and approval. Move items so A and B. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Passes four in favor with Commissioner on the Hill off the dais. The second recommendation is concerning the cancellation of residential rehab grant program liens and all of these recipients have met their one year of compliance and there's an A and B for your review and approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion second, please vote. That passes four in favor. I right, Commissioner on the Hill off the dais. And our, our third recommendation and last one is the recommendation concerning our residential roof program funding and lead agreement and there's an A and B for your review and approval. Move items A and B. Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. That passes four in favor with Commissioner on the Hill off the dais. And that concludes the agenda for from us, sir. Are there any items for discussion? If not, we stand adjourned, Mr. Chairman. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Commissioner Mayor. Give them a second. Thank you, ladies. Switch over. All right. Good morning. This is the uh, Agenda review for the Board of County Commissioners regular scheduled meeting for June 3rd. Uh, I have the invocation tonight. Um, Commissioner Barry, do you want to do the pledge, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there uh, any items to be added to the agenda? Uh, all were loaded in previous to this morning. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have one. We can discuss it right now if, you, if you'd care to. Um, it's going to be related to the way that we fulfill, the way the county fulfills public records requests. Yes, sir. Um, so I don't know who would be privy to, uh, who would be privy to answer the question, but uh, evidently there was a public records request related to me that was fulfilled um, yesterday, which is fine. I don't have any issue with that. But, um, you know, first of all, our office wasn't notified, and uh, <clears throat> the items were... Um, the items were given to the uh, to the requester without being uh, without being uh, reviewed through the attorney's office for what might need to be redacted and what's not. So I'd like to know uh, right now who fulfilled that. I don't know if uh, I, I don't I don't know who is fulfilling requests and whiting out social security numbers on their own accord. But that's not the way the process should be. And if the board needs to define that process to ensure that anything before it goes to a citizen goes through the attorney's office to see what may or may not be, need to be redacted. Um, and I'm presuming our staff person redacted it before the person posted it on the internet. 
maybe it was given to them with the social security numbers on there, I don't know, and maybe that person blacked them out before they put them online. I, I, I'm not privy to that, but if someone wants to explain to me who fulfilled something. Debbie? Uh, <laughs> would you give me a minute to investigate that? Um, I'm not exactly sure. You don't know? Okay, uh, give me a second to investigate with staff and I'll Okay, well okay. regardless, we're gonna, if my colleagues would, would indulge me, we're gonna take up, I'd like to take that up tonight to, um, to refine the process or clarify the process that uh, whatever, before it goes out the door, needs to go through the attorney's office to see what may or may not need to be redacted. A lay person may know that you need to redact social security numbers. They may not know all the things that would be, need to be redacted from a form or from any kind of public records that are submitted. And uh, I see Debbie has stepped out, but I'm certainly, I'm sorry, she just backed up in her chair. Um, I'm certainly presuming that I'll be able to, we'll be able to uh, narrow down where that request was fulfilled because that's not the way that this, that's not the way that this should brought, that this should work. And unless, again, my colleagues disagree with me. That isn't the process. And so we're gonna research it right now. I don't know. I mean, there's some form that was posted to uh, that was posted online that has social security numbers and stuff. As my, apparently my social security number is on the form six times or so, and it's blacked out. But it wasn't blacked out. It wasn't redacted through the attorney's office, so I don't know. You know, and I don't know if it was redacted by the person that received them, because I mean, again, I think a lay person would know. I probably shouldn't post somebody's social security number on Facebook. So maybe they, maybe the recipient blacked them out. I don't know. But again, that's, <laughs> that's not the way this is supposed to work in any form or fashion, I don't believe. Well, it's, re it's real simple, Commissioner. I mean, somebody released it, and so the person that released it should be able to tell you whether or not they redacted your name. Again, I haven't seen the form. I'm, I'm told what was put online. I haven't seen what was online. I'm just told it's a form that contains my social security number in a half dozen places. So I think we as a board need to be more clear about what we expect. I would have thought that was clear before, but it seems as if there's some, some uh, miscommunication maybe between the dais and, uh, uh, and the county leadership. Sure. So let me ask a question just because, Allison. What, what is not a, a, a public record in an employee's personnel file? An employee's personnel file is one of the unique situations where there is a ton of potential exemptions, a ton. It's the one department we always are very alarmed uh, about to make sure that those things go through the legal department because the, the list of different things that could possibly be exempt in a personnel file is, is a very long list. And I don't even know in this case what, what was requested or what was turned over. I just know that there's something posted online and it had social security number on it for a commissioner in multiple places and it's scratched out, so. We need to have this discussion because I'm working on a public records request at the moment and it entails a lot of detail from my personal Facebook pages, my county commissioner Facebook page, which is unofficial but maintained by me, my blog, which is made by me but unofficial but contains public records, but um, we were told, Stephen, that uh, I guess there's someone in the county that can go through the email boxes and mine uh, for information, which is fine with me, but like you're saying, that should come back to us before it's released so that we can do our own due diligence and make sure there's nothing yeah. in there. I, 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 thought that's how, I thought that's how this stuff worked. It, it, there's a, in my opinion, there seems to be a clear miscommunication between the leadership on this dais and than the corresponding county leadership about whose rules will be followed and, and whose won't be followed. Yeah. This is not these, these, the decisions that we make and the policies that we have are our policies. Yes. And they're not to be circumnavigated or, uh, or, or gone around by whether it's, and I, again, I don't know who pulled the request. I know that IT has the ability to pull emails out of the server mm -hmm. without notifying us. Well, that, that ability may exist 
but we still need to be not we still need to be it doesn't remove the responsibility to notify us and to still have those emails vetted through the county attorney's office for other information that may be protected in there i'm not an expert on what those are but we have multiple you know people in the attorney's office that get paid to be experts on that yes and that is candidly the board's that is the board's level of protection for the decision you know for the decisions that we make and it it's disappointing. It's well, shocking, candidly, well, but it's disappointing, uh, you know, on another level. Well, taking it one step further, though, I, I would be concerned that someone doesn't fulfill it properly, and then it's got my name attached or your name attached. Oh, this was the public records request from Bragash. I didn't know about it. I didn't fulfill it. And, oh, by the way, it wasn't complete because I wasn't told about it, and I didn't have the opportunity to go through it. Because all the public records may not be contained on this on the county server. Exactly. And, I mean, that's uh, you're uh, absolutely right. So, so Stephen, who who released it, and are we certain that it was released within the last <coughs> day or so? Because that would concern me. Because I, I, I have heard about one particular form that has been requested, and and it has to do with me and all the people who filled it out. I'm not sure, Jeff. So, but we're, are we sure it was released by the county? Are we sure that happened? I don't know how else they would have gotten it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how else they would have got it if it yeah. wasn't really I found, I found out 10 minutes ago, Jeff. I, I'm not sure, buddy. I'm, I'm hoping but, okay. that. It's his but, personnel file. You know, we got even a bigger problem if his personnel file was released by somebody other than the county, Jeff. Well, again, because, yes, there's some exempted material in there. That we have to be very, very careful about releasing. And um, so we, I think we, first and foremost, we got to get to the bottom of that. Debbie, I think we need to find out immediately if that Who happened. released it? And I mean, if so, simple. who made that decision? I mean, that's simple. I mean, I mean, we don't have to be a rocket science to figure that one out. I mean, someone released it, and there's electronic. <laughs> I mean, we well, can figure it, it out. it may not have been electronically, though. You know, so. But, but Jeff, wow. I think you bring up a great point, was that uh, if we're not aware of public record requests, then then we can't be certain that everything's been presented. That's the biggest concern for me. I have nothing to hide. Uh, uh, right. My fear is they don't give everything that I know exists, and then later it comes back on us like a boomerang. Well, right. look, you didn't fulfill the record. Well, Jeff, we all know when we go into public office, I mean, our life becomes a public book, and you've been there long enough, and, and that's fine with me. But even if it's not the legality uh, uh, of the law, uh, it's the common courtesy that if someone releases something of my personnel file, that they have the common decency to tell me that they're releasing something. Uh, it would be nice to know before you read it on Facebook. Right. Or, yeah. And so, I mean, that's just common courtesy. And, you know, or even if you don't see it on Facebook before you hear about it. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not going to go. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to go on Facebook and look. But, Allison, back to what you, I remember my orientation first elected at FACT. There are certain things that are exempt, like you said, because my beneficiaries. And so I may have, I may have, I may leave it to my, my son and not my daughter. And that's something that's in my will that I don't want. And so when you start releasing someone's personnel file, I mean, there are some things that are protected by law. And I, and I just remember that from one of my orientation classes at FACT. Absolutely. And when you get down into the organizational chart, I mean, certain home addresses, certain home phone numbers, certain photographs, there's a, a laundry list of medical type information, retirement account information. Uh, well, it could HIPAA. be my kid's school. It could be an address where my mother lives. Uh, in some, I mean, in, in, this, in, in this atmosphere of, I mean, you could be putting someone's life in danger without them knowing. Uh, by releasing that information. Commissioner, I, th I think it's uh, um, uh, going back to the, the fact example of, of them going through what it is and what it isn't. And so, um, yes, the layperson may say, well, here's an email that uh, uh, that someone sent you from a family gathering that contains pictures in it of the family gathering. And then at the bottom they say, you know, please vote for this zoning change uh, down the street. The only thing that, that would be be public is the part where he says vote for the zoning thing you know that that his name uh, and that and that that's what they asked for the the information about the the family gathering you went to and the pictures attached are, are not a public record candidly yeah candidly mr chairman I, I think that we've this is you know specifically a you know specifically a very to me you know very important issue but I think there's a broader issue of um, it appears as who is actually making the decisions that run the county. There seems to be some, uh, you know, some some confusion about that because these 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 decisions 
shouldn't be made in a, in a vacuum of this comes in and I'm just going to do what I think. The board, we have policies and then we're tasked with making the decisions that aren't black and white and at best these decisions that appear to be being made aren't black and white and if anything they're, they're black and white and clearly not being done the way they should be. But you know, at best they might be gray. Those decisions need to come, come before the board for how, to, how do we want this handled or at least the two employees that the board employs, at least those that we have some recourse for the way that, you know, for the way that they're, they're, they work, you know? Um, I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't, if y'all disagree, please, spe please say so, but, you know, we've got a lot of interaction and a lot of ability to work with the attorney and with the administrator. Outside of that, I have no control over what, <coughs> over what these people do, and, um, and I'm, you know, rather unhappy. But. Well, I'm, I mean, I think it's, uh, even this morning, um, I, I guess we had a public records request come in um, la end, of the month, end of the month, last month, and, and we were trying to just find it in the system, and it wasn't showing up, you know, and it's, you know, get the email that, that the response is passed due or whatever, we can't even see what the request is. So, um, anyway. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll add that to the discussion. So, Commissioner, um, who's re I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I don't need, who's responsible for releasing public records? So Tina Tina is our responsible party for all public records. But the process is it goes in, it comes in, it goes into our system and gets fettered out to the appropriate uh, departments. Um, and then when it comes all back to Tina, she goes through the uh, county attorney's office. So I'm going to double check. Hypothetically. Hi yeah, well, that's did, the I mean, did Tina, did Tina fulfill this request? No. She's no. two feet from you. No? no? No, she did not. Okay. Well. So that's why I'm looking to find out what happened. <laughs> okay. Commissioner May, do you have anything to add tonight? No. Okay. No. Commissioner Bar oh, sorry, Commissioner Bergosh, do you have anything to add tonight? I don't have anything to add. Uh, Madam Assistant. Administrator, do you have anything to add tonight? Everything's already been added? Yeah. Okay. Um, commissioners uh, Forum, Commissioner Barry, anything else? Uh, Commissioner May? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, but I may be uh, in and out um, of the meeting tonight. I mean, I won't be gone. I mean, I'll, I'll be late, I'll be here, and then I'll be back. So, okay. Uh, there's obligations with my son that I, I have to attend, so of I'll course. be in and out. <coughs> Commissioner Bagosh. I just want to thank um, all the people out at the, uh, um, your district, out at the island, the Santa Rosa Island Authority, um, all the folks that work out there. Obviously, there's a, a big weekend, um, and uh, uh, I'm thankful the bridge was open. I happened to have the opportunity to be out in the Fort Pickens area, um, and I just would say uh, things went very well out there, so far as I could tell, and just happy for all the people pulling from the same end of the rope to get the bridge open, to get things back to normal at the beach. So. Um, thankful, and then of course, um, would be remiss if we did not uh, thank those who served in the military. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of us enjoy a long weekend uh, without thinking about <laughs> the people in uniform uh, who've made the ultimate sacrifice. So I know, um, from my perspective, uh, that's very very important and weighs heavily on my mind. Um, with a son that's in the Navy, my daughter was in the Air Force, my brother's in the Marines, grandfather was in the Army, um, my, our whole family. Uh, with, with the exception of me, uh, served in the military. So we thank everyone that serves in the military, for, and th especially those who gave the sacrifice. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I was able to attend the, um, the, the uh, memorial event at uh, uh, Veterans Memorial Park. Um, mm -hmm. Got to see their new bathrooms that, that they have, which is, which, is, which is great for them. Um, and uh, so was was uh, was honored to be there to to remember those that have served and and um, lost their lives uh, defending us. So um, also uh, yes, I do want to thank everybody that was um, was involved in getting the bridge open. Um, it was uh, of course as we said we didn't we weren't going to believe it until we saw it, and so we we uh, we were tracking to have it open by Friday. Um, but uh, of course, um, you know, things can happen outside of our control. And, and so we just kept, 
kept making sure that we were encouraging to, that it was it was done as quickly as possible and and if that could be before the weekend then, then that was great so uh, I got a call about five minutes before it opened and said it's opening in five minutes and and um, and then um, a short while later I called back and I said okay you've you've had 15 minutes of the two lanes being open when's the the four lane open um, and and um, but but really we we are uh, continuing to push to get the four lanes open. Um, that that is is what is what we need. That's what we want, and um, and and so we look forward to continuing to to work with FDOT and and their contractor to uh, to get that done. Um, because it, it. But you know, I've heard this is what I love. I, I see all these messages on Friday morning. I, I arrived at work so happy this morning. You know, I I got a second cup of coffee at home, or I got a cup of coffee at home. Um, and uh, and then really to, to to do it going into the the long weekend for the businesses and 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 everybody who wanted to get out to the beach to enjoy a perfect weekend um, that was that was great um, so uh, just want to say thank you I know our work's not done yet um, and we are still working to get everything else uh, reopened so um, um, we we'll work on that it was it was. <laughs> You know, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, I think it's going well so far. I mean, it's, um, I, I do have to say, though, it was, um, I, I called uh, Mayor Finch, and I said that was the first time I'd ever entered Gulf Breeze and felt like I could speed up. Because um, I, I went 35 the whole way across the bridge, and I figured I could at least do 37 through Gulf Everyone Breeze. Gulf Breeze. And so, um, um, it's a white Dodge. Uh, yeah. The, the, I'm going to tell the chief a different, different make and model of my car, but, uh, but no, it, it, I mean, it's, so I hope everyone, uh, and, I, and a few times that I've gone over, it seems like everyone's trying to follow the speed limit and, um, you know, we, we, we know the alternative now if something happens there and, and we want to make sure that we can keep it open and, and people get here safely and um, so. Uh, I would say though, if we, there are our F dot has cameras on each end of the bridge, so you can go to to uh, their cameras at, at F dot five one one, pull up the cameras to see what the current traffic's like on on the three mile bridge. There's the the north end and the south end, and they move around and, and show you different angles. So um, if you want to check things out before you go, uh, I would recommend that. Uh, and, and so it's um, you know we're starting to get more and more um, traffic cams up and, and available. So. Yeah, because um, I know you've got a, the, the bat phone line to F dot. When you're coming, when, when you're going northbound on the bridge coming back to Pensacola, um, you get over the hump and you know it's going to go to one lane. Um, I noticed there was a lot of consternation because there's no signage on which lane. So I think perhaps maybe perhaps they could say, hey, left lane ends ahead, so you know which lane to be in. Just yeah, because I didn't see a sign. But I mean, yeah. So um, it's not a complaint, just a yeah. comment. Yeah, and, and and on that, you know, I, of course, a lot of people have said, hey, why not have the merge before the hump? Because no, I like the word, but I want to know because I want to get right. I don't want to be the road rager. But what I also want to say is is that um, you know the design of the bridge, the hump, it, you know, the speeds that you should be traveling. If you're traveling 35 miles an hour, if traffic is stopped just on the other side of the hump, mm -hmm. you should still have time to stop. Oh, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so I, I, people were worried that they that they could come over the hump and and there's there's stoppage, but all you know it's it's rated it's designed for a higher speed to be able to do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, um, like I said, it was smooth. That was the only improvement. Right. That could be. So we'll 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 mention that to them. So. Robert, in your conversations with F. Dot, uh, we continue to work on the other bridge right now yeah so they they've uh when we were out there they they had had uh, another crew up from orlando so as one was working on on the repairs another one was was still moving forward with the uh with the new bridge right. um there's still uh you have a completion date uh, a target uh date? so they they say early next year so for about the last two months i've just been saying about this time next year really uh you oh, know okay. i mean just <laughs> yeah. it, it's um but yeah that's what they're um uh, again, ho hopefully things continue to be on schedule with that. But so you really um, think about this time next year, by Memorial Day next year, you think we'll be? I, 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 I would not stake my career on it, but um, <laughs> it's um, uh, again, it'd be optimistic to have to have it all open by by then. Um, you know, I, I, the landings coming along, I think that was a a, a huge 
um, benefit for us um, that we were able to get the four lanes on the landing open um, and as opposed to trying to having to um, you know merge Chase Street and Bayfront into one lane you know those two roads merge and then merge into one lane on top of it so uh, the fact that we have about an extra mile of, of two lane is great and also coming off and, and having access to 17th so and I, and I guess as our, our bid tax are still up I mean occupancy is still good on the beach it uh, is even with the bridge being out. Yep, what I understand. It is. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we still have some hotels that are that are down uh, from from the hurricane, and and um, but uh, every year except once in, in this in this fiscal year, Madam Clerk, I believe, has been record setting, even over really? 2019. Even with the bridge out. Even Amazing. with the bridge out. But again, the, I'm not saying that the beach has been up, but overall, um, the collections have been up. Uh, so. over over previous years so of course hurricane sally contributed to that unfortunately but um but we are seeing a lot of short-term rentals and and they've been they've been uh, all the hotels that have been available or have been booked on the beach so and, well, and rob thank you for your leadership i know the bridge is i know it was go over at one time but uh, i know the beach is near and dear to your heart and uh, the bridge, I think, is near and dear to all of our heart because uh, all of our constituents uh, like to well, visit the beach, and you know, you, you've stayed on top of it. All, so. all those businesses yeah. along Gregory, I mean, you know, McGuire's, Bagelheads, uh, uh, another Broken Egg, all those restaurants there—they they were all suffering with it being out as well. Um, oh, and servers that work at McGuire's, that, right? You know, live in Gulf Breeze or or, or, Tiger or, Park, you or know, teachers. I mean, so it's. I, it's hey, a challenge. I, I still feel bad for the Arkansas State team, the parents that. When they came to watch their kids play in the Sun Belt, they booked the closest hotel they could find to the Bay Center, and that was the Hampton Inn on Gulf Breeze. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah. Yeah. you know, next year. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and we're excited about that Sun Belt too, Robert. That you're mentioning, I'm working with Ray Palmer and some of the high school coaches, and with SYSA. I mean, there's, I think there's going to be some exciting times uh, yep. for uh, the Sun Belt with uh, being able to branch out with our high school sports next year. Yes, um, and. And I, I just saw her walk in, so I'll go ahead and, and recognize her. But, but for those that haven't had the opportunity to meet the new um, Island Authority Director, Lee Davis, um, she's, she's joined us. Go ahead, Lee, stand up. And um, so she, uh, almost a month now, I guess, right? Um, six weeks. Second. Six weeks, okay. <laughs> and, uh, but, but survived her first Memorial Day uh, weekend, busy weekend. Um, and I'd say we're still on track for Blue Angel weekend. That's, what, that's probably the big question. So. Uh, still on track for Blue Angel and uh, and Fourth of July coming up. So, um, but I think all the feedback we've gotten was that was that everybody did a great job at the beach this weekend and and it was it was a great time. So I know everyone's. If you want to come up and and say hi and 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 uh, please. Good morning, commissioners. Um, as Commissioner Bender said, I am Lee Davis. I've been uh, executive director of the SRIA now a whopping six weeks, so um, still learning uh, a tremendous amount, as you might imagine. It is great to be back in Escambia County, though. I was born and raised here, so it's nice to uh, be home, and my family's really glad to have me accessible now. Um, yeah, we are gearing up for Blue Angels and for 4th of July. Uh, Commissioner May, like you mentioned, uh, the bridge being open is obviously near and dear to our hearts as well. Um, we did have a, a successful opening weekend with Memorial Day weekend out at the beach. So uh, that was great news and our businesses are glad to see people flowing over that bridge again for sure. Um, other than gearing up for Blue Angels and the 4th of July, we're working on our budget as well, which of course we get to you guys uh, for your, your review and approval of that as well. So thank you for having me this morning. And uh, commissioners, over the course of the next couple of weeks, I will be contacting your office. I'd love to just come and uh, sit down with each of you and, and learn a little bit more about your independent districts and, and how they work and the things that are important to each of you. So um, your aides can expect a call and hopefully we can get something set up. So thank you, Commissioner Bender. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. And of course, I've um, enjoyed working with you these last six weeks um, and, and look forward to, to a couple more years. So thank you and, and thank you for all you do out there. Um, Debbie, you have anything you want to? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, if you allow us, we're very excited to introduce our new EMS manager. Eric, would, would you and uh, David please come up?
Good morning, Commissioners. I'd like to introduce to you David Torcell, our new EMS manager. Started uh, Tuesday, was in orientation all day Tuesday with us. Uh, hit the ground running yesterday, uh, making a lot of, uh, I had to make some decisions right out the gate, meeting with the crews, and uh, we're excited to have him here and the prospects of what he brings from Alachua County. I'll let him t address you guys now. Sure. Okay. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Uh, first, I want to tell you how excited I am to be here. Uh, this has been an opportunity, I think, for me that's uh, been years in the making. Uh, I bring to you 24 years of experience in public safety, and I'm looking forward to using that uh, to benefit Escambia County and benefit our personnel and, most importantly, our citizens and our community. Uh, as, uh, as Director Gilmore said, I have uh, hit the ground running. I've uh, been here for a couple of days, had an opportunity to meet with my supervisors, meet with our personnel, get to know everybody, have an understanding of the challenges that we, uh, we are currently having and some challenges that we're going to be looking forward to facing head on. Um, I make no promises other than this. I will give you 110% all of the time. And I'm not a person that deals in absolutes, but I will absolutely uh, say this. We will provide the best service and the best customer uh, care and patient care to the citizens and the visitors of Escambia County. And we will be advocates for our patients and for the citizens and visitors of Escambia County. You have my word on that. I look forward to the opportunity to meeting and discussing things more with you all and for what we are and what we can be in EMS. Thank you all very much. David, thank you so much. Welcome. Happy to have you here and, and look forward to your leadership. Um, I, just real quick, I, I, I didn't mention this in public forum, but I, I was just happened to be at a fire station uh, Tuesday night and uh, a call came in and uh, there, there was a structure fire and, um, and I, I think it was uh, universal with how quickly EMS responded and uh, the, I think the patient had suffered some injuries. I won't get into those, but, uh, uh, but uh, he, he was quickly departed the scene and, and, and was on his way to the hospital. So um, uh, go ahead and give kudos for, for them for, for being there and, and, um, and, and taking care of that patient and, and um, you know, look forward to, to working with you. Yes, sir. Appreciate Thank you it. so much. Absolutely. Thanks Thank you. Welcome so. on board. Appreciate it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, so, okay. Um, proclamations, we have it for the uh, Employee of the Month, and also Jeff, you have your, are, are they all coming tonight? Or? Uh, I'll have a, a group of them, okay. the ones that aren't, we'll go ahead and make sure they get the, uh, okay. Um, and then, board, I know that um, this morning we have, um, a, uh, a presentation from DPZ. Do we want to go ahead and 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 take that now? Yeah, probably. Let's. What, what are you thinking as far as some time parameters, Mr. Chairman? Um, my understanding is this presentation takes about thirty minutes from what they did during. Um, uh, uh, I guess it was yesterday. Um, the planning board. Is that about right, Marina? We can make it shorter. Okay. okay. Make it shorter. I mean, especially if you're, if you're also, you know, kind of especially has to talk about it. Sure. And yeah. And, and we appreciate you sending the information. We, we, we all got the packages. I was able to look at it. So absolutely, if we can make it brief, that'd be great. And uh, we appreciate you finishing up. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank y'all for being here in person. I'm, I, I, I'm an in-person person. So <laughs> thank y'all for not doing Zoom and coming. <laughs> um, so... Do you guys want to go ahead and come on up? Yep, please. And I, there's a there's a little gate right here, or you can go all the way around. Yep. So is this the final report here, what we're getting today? Yes. Okay. It's really an update because we're still working on final details with the county staff. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, commissioners, let me, uh, the Ontario Barrier Project Manager, let me uh, kind of tell you what we're doing. You know, from our last meeting to this meeting, we were asked to kind of wrap everything up by May 31st. And the DPC team has, has done a very good job. They've given us the draft code. And, uh, and so that's what they're presenting today. Right now, staff is currently reviewing it. We still need some more review time to finish that and get those comments uh, fed back in. That's probably gonna take us a little bit longer to get that, but we wanted to go ahead and present exactly what we had today so we can get your comments. I've also given this information, Scott Luth has this information, he's reviewing it. We're getting his comments. So we're, we're in the process of trying to get all the final comments in so that we can get to the final document. And, and so uh, you're just here this morning, right? Yeah, so, um, uh, so we're, we'll just have this this morning um, and uh, there, there's no vote on it today. Uh, just presentation yes, and sir. so we can give some feedback and let you guys go so all right thank, thank you. you Terry all right Marina all thank you um, we're happy to be here in person and I'm joined by Mike from DPZ of course Peter from Weitzman and then Travis somewhere as you know him and then we also have uh, Giorgio on the line Mary Chell on the line and Philip on the line we we gave this presentation it lasted about half an hour at the planning board and then we had questions if you want us to cut it short, or if you have specific slides you want us to speak to in particular, we're happy to do that. Um, or we can just try, try run through this. We also have one slide that we added that you haven't seen, which is just questions we want to ask you to help um, further guide this process. So I would say we could probably just do the, the general overview. Um, looking at all the different maps, probably don't need to dive into each of those, I think, you know, but... Um, Okay, that, I'll, I'll try to do that. I'm going to try to keep my present, Yeah, I'm going to try to keep it myself at 10 minutes. I'm going to ask every consultant on the line to do maybe two minutes. Uh, well, may, Mary Chell may be may a little longer, but maybe she, you know, if you have questions about transportation, you can just ask in the, in the Q&A. Sure, sure. Okay, great. So I'm going to go to the next one. You've seen this, this so this is, what, this is what sort of guided us into phase three. I don't need to speak more about this. Uh, the first thing we have to do, of course, is change the future land use map. We are making recommendations to uh, make the majority of it MUU and some certain portions of it C. Uh, we are, of course, asking for an increase in density in a very small portion, about 31 acres of the entire site, and you will see that. This is the adjusted hybrid master plan. Um, you know, we adjusted it to show for more commerce with a little bit of, of residential. That's the one we, um, we ran the transportation numbers on. We ran the number, the, um, the uh, Giorgio did the stormwater calculations on, et cetera, and the streets and that sort of stuff. So we have a regulating plan which will become regulatory, and you're going to see it. I'll speak about it in more detail, but we're, we have certain mandatory streets and then put the potential for discretionary streets. The mandatory streets would be coded in. The discretionary streets are up to the, um, to the individual uh, developers who come in. If it's residential, there are more streets. If there's commercial, it's probably less streets. And we're providing a bit of wiggle room for where those streets would go. And then, we of, of course, we have a series of regulating plans and uh, specific areas where we're indicating a need for open space. So, the, so you know, we spent a lot of time debating how to um, activate the different regulating plans and sunset certain ideas. So we, so you'll discuss the timing of this. Um, we're, we're proposing it on a five-year time frame. You may want to shorten that, lengthen it, and then that has to do with some of the questions we have. But essentially, the, the, here's the first zoning map. I won't describe the zones unless you have questions about them, but you've sort of heard us describe it. The light gray is obviously light industrial. The blue is commerce, and I can speak to the, the differences between the commerce and the light industrial. The, the light industrial allows all the uses that the commerce does in addition to some of the bigger uh, storage buildings, warehouse buildings, um, and, and a few other of the uses. So then here's the uses. We, we're working with the uses you have in the county. Uh, we've tried to consolidate some, but we didn't want to reinvent the way the uses are done. It's just easier for the for staff to administer. So um, you will see here the uses that are allowed in each, in each zoning district. And here it is, and we have a few conditions. The conditional uses that typically apply around the county are also going to apply now. Uh, and then at a certain time, one zoning map expires and another one comes into place. And the, and the first one is uh, a, a transition from light industrial to more commerce types, um, which is essentially just wouldn't allow for, very, the, the, as I mentioned, the very, very big buildings. The next one, um, 10 years from now or 11 years from now, would uh, transition to uh, a portion in the, south, in the northeast, uh, northwest quadrant would transition to 
allow for residential, it would still allow for commerce, and it would still allow for, um, for everything that's allowed in the commerce zones. And then at the very end, 2037, the, the other map expires. This should say zoning map four. In my presentation, it was updated. There's no, it went from three to five. That's our mistake. We apologize. It's really four. But this is where we would allow for single family housing. So the Z6 is the only place that would really allow for single family detached housing. Everything else is either townhouses, duplexes, small multifamily. And of course, in the center, uh, multifamily. Now, what we're doing with the center is um, that the Z1 is where we're recommending 60 units an acre. And that would be um, for five stories. We've talked with the county about maybe making that four stories instead of five, and then having the fifth story be a sort of a bonus story where you could, um, if somebody were to, were to provide a green roof or if someone were to provide a public benefit that you could um, that you could extract from them for a whole set of reasons. It could be for affordable housing somewhere. It could be for additional open space, uh, greening of the buildings. Uh, that's a possibility to do that. Uh, the Z2 is exactly the same uses around the perimeter, but it's allowing it to go to three stories, and everything else is essentially uh, capped at three stories. This is the way the code is organized. I don't need to go into details. Um, it's about 80 pages. Of course, there are the general provisions which provide for the intent, which we're always telling staff is very important. You go back to the intent to understand. So when you're going to be activating the projects, you would be reviewing them to make sure that they comply with the intent. The top three are really trying to encourage the economic um, impact that you want to see on the site. And then the applicability has to do with um, obviously saying that these new regulations uh, supersede what's existing right now. We, we're distinguishing regulations which are activated by shall from guidelines which are activated by should, where sh they should be encouraged, and obviously a ways in which to activate the master plan and the regulating plan. And then we have, uh, and we, uh, well, I won't speak in detail to these, but we'll go through them, but what you're going to see is a sort of very user-friendly one-pager that, that, that provides for the setbacks, the, the height, the um, lot coverage, the open space requirements, the building height, all of that for each of the different zones. Right now you're seeing where it is, but we, we hope to put the uses next to it so a property owner with just one or two pages can see exactly what they can do on there and then what, what, are, the, um, what are the standards or the, the, the development controls that apply to each zone. You know, we're showing the light industrial going up to three stories. We anticipate some will be one, that's okay. The big difference is, you know, we're requiring that buildings come closer to the street, that parking be hidden, that utilities be screened, and that sort of stuff. And here's the neighborhood general. This is where uh, we would see the, the, the three-story sort of mix of some live work units, potentially some six-packs, some uh, small uh, townhouses, not small townhouses, a small, small single family attached, such as townhouses, duplexes, triplexes, that sort of stuff. And then here are the single family zones in response to what's up on the other side of Frank Reader. I'm sorry, you know, the presentation is funky here. I have a better, I, I don't see it like that on my slides, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Cho to talk a little bit about transportation. Thanks, Marina. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, thank you. So, well, I cannot see the slides, so I'm gonna go through the ones I have on my screen, oh. so feel free to keep sure. um, moving on. Um, so I'm gonna briefly explain uh, the results of the traffic analysis that we did as part of this project. The goal was to uh, estimate uh, the number of new trips that the master plan would generate and the impact uh, on the transportation networks. Um, on the first slides, you see the, the land use progr program that we, um, that we use, as well as the number of jobs. And also we accounted for a new school with middle uh, and high schoolers uh, on the site. Um, we use the model, uh, it's uh, called MXD model, that accounts for the, the networks on the site um, and also the provision uh, of walk, bike, and transit networks. Um, and the results are shown uh, on the screen right now. So um, with the, these land use programs, the anticipated number of new trips are 44,000 a day. Um, and they're distributed uh, as shown here. So 8% would be internal, so they wouldn't leave the site. 3% would be external trips, but uh, would be walk, bike, or transit trips. Uh, and close to 90% would be external vehicle trips. Uh, if we look at the, the purpose of the trips, so 75% would be trips, uh, home-related trips, so uh, one of the 
the ends of the trip would be uh, home, and 25% of those would be work, uh, home work trips. And then if we look at the peak hours, 8.5% uh, of the daily trips would be concentrated during, during the AM peak hours. Uh, and 11.5% during the PM peak hours. Uh, and the reason why it's a bit higher on the PM, it's because uh, the site has also retail uses. So normally there's more diversity of uh, trip purposes in the afternoon. Uh, the chart on the left that we see here shows the, the vehicle trips uh, in and out of the site during these peak hours. And we see, of course, there's higher numbers uh, of trips going in in the AM as a result of the jobs, um, and there's, there's very sparse uh, during the PM. Next slide, Marina, please. Yep. So with these results, we did uh, the micro simulation, uh, and the methodology is the same as we explained in the existing conditions. So we made some assumptions um, of the trip distribution, and then we assigned that uh, to the road network. And we looked at 2040 future scenarios. Um, I'm only going to show the results of the 2040 with the project, but we also, uh, the report includes a 2040 future scenario without the project so that it accounts for uh, other growth that will happen in the region and related to this uh, master plan. The, the intersections that you see on the screens are the ones that we, that we analyzed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what you see on the screen are the results of this micro simulation analysis. Um, and it's what it tells us is the average delay per vehicle at each of these intersections. Um, so for those of you that are not familiarized with the level of service analysis, A is good and F would be bad. Uh, so when we see an E, it would be like the maximum that it's acceptable, and F is something that uh, I mean, it would require some kind of mitigation um, solution to improve that. But we overall see good results. Um, uh, most of the intersections have uh, levels of service A to D. Some of them have E. And just one has F, which is one of the entry exits that we assume on Frank Rieder Road. And the reason why it's F is because it's, uh, we didn't account for a signal there. Uh, but with a signal, that would drop down to see. Um, eventually. A next slide, Marina, please. Uh, what we see, what we show here is, are these the same results, but in, uh, in the map, so that's easy to see where the, the issues are. Uh, we see that during the PM, there's some, uh, so there's some E levels, which is means that there's a uh, high delay uh, in Frank Rieder and Bueller Road, and also on the westbound uh, round of the new interchange uh, on I-10 and Ambular road. And I, I wanted to say that this is like the worst case scenario. Uh, so while we accounted for the mix of users and we assumed that a local transit route would serve the site, the site, these numbers don't account for other potential transportation programs that would uh, incentivize, for example, the share uh, of vehicle trips or more uh, use of um, alternative modes. Next slide, Marina, please. And, and last, uh, we wanted to uh, to explain that in the report, there's a thoroughfare plan uh, where we provided five street cross sections uh, that um, that that are flexible to a point that uh, it can you can have like eleven different street types. Um, where each of the elements changes based on the functionality and the adjacent land uses of each of the streets. And back to you, Marina. Thank you, Wenjia. I'm going to ask Giorgio to speak briefly on the green infrastructure. Yes, thank you, Marina. Hello, everyone. Um, we wanted, I wanted to mention that uh, you're looking at the picture which shows the uh, the, gre the green areas and also the lakes which are incorporated within the master plan. Uh, the yellow arrows point to the uh, drainage direction, which in general follow the pre-development. So post-development and pre-development drainage have the same pattern. Uh, the purpose of, of this is to maximize retention on site and to reduce runoff. And uh, in addition, I wanted to mention that all of the areas that are below 100, the, the 100 feet contour will be in a conservation area. 
So they will provide opportunities for additional treatment. Uh, this system, uh, the stormwater management system, is designed by a series of interconnected lakes and conveyances to provide retention and water quality um, improvements and to increase the recharge of the aquifer, which are critical for sustainability of, of this project. And next slide, Marina. Um, there are a number of green corridors within the site which uh, in, uh, provide conveyance, but we also provide filtration to the ground. The lakes or the dry ponds that are designed, they're designed as a recreation facilities and they will be able to be used as a park or any other recreation purposes. They have really low slopes uh, and no fencing is required, so they will be um, a landscape with landscaping they will be improved by landscaping and they will be integrated with the urban plan uh, the objective of this is to reduce the overall cost of the stormwater uh, treatment and attenuation for 100 years event we followed the um, the county uh, regulations and also the northwest uh, florida water management district requirements for designing these ponds um, in addition, I wanted to also mention that uh, the size of these lakes is basically was assumed that, uh, to, for a fully built condition. They were calculated for fully built condition and with some additional increase of 15% so, uh, of the volumes. So they will be able to provide of, um, attenuation and treatment of the stormwater. And, and that's all for now. Marina, back to you. Thank you. And before I turn it over to Philip's valuation, which is on the taxable um, income, I want to say that it, um, it's in addition to the economic impact of the jobs, which accounts for about 1.36 billion a year for the 4,000 jobs. Philip. Thank you, Marina. Uh, well said. Yes, this is just the, the property uh, taxes. So we jumped right in to take the hybrid plan and test it out in our model, just like all of the others. Uh, so that you see the plan in the middle there and you see to the right and left a couple of different images of how how those expected buildings on their parcels would generate property value per acre which of course turns into your taxes as well the red spikes that are the tallest are where you're getting those mixture of uses uh, more building stacked on top and a little little less parking than maybe usual because of the mixed uses uh, so allowing a lot of value per acre the orange I think it's French fry looking portion of the map there is where those townhomes come in still with a lot of value per acre, but not quite like that mixed use commercial. And then sort of in an average yellow plateau, uh, the the more commerce oriented uh, parcels, which are still fairly average because until you know exactly whether you're getting a warehouse or a high tech manufacturing, uh, we, we have to kind of move in a more average place. So on our next slide, we'll compare this hybrid plan to the four that, that we started with uh, and show that it's it's still moving in uh, pretty strong on value. There is a, a residential component. So you see that little bit of potential fluctuation with uh, tax exemptions there uh, at the top, but we expect to see something in the in the order of magnitude of around $4 million of county taxes if uh, if it at, at full development uh, under this pathway. And we wanted to also roads, roads change as development pattern changes. So we wanted to kind of contextualize that with that red that you see under the bar. Um, it's also, it's really, I think, perhaps most similar to the, the market plan if you're um, if you're looking for a comparison in the in the first phases of the plan. Uh, but then on our next slide, what we did was test out some of these alternative futures. If we can estimate the value of the existing plan, which is in the largest image or the far left bar, uh, we can kind of figure out what the average value looks like it would be in those zones, and then we can assume that each of these these three smaller images to the right or the three bars, the set first, second, and third sunset, are what happens if you do end up with, with just that first change or that second change or that third change. And what I really take away from this chart is that although the, uh, the total area of the site, of course, doesn't change, uh, each of those sunsets uh, intensifies those zones a little bit. And so overall, your, your total property value would be expected to rise a little bit more in each of those. And that's, that's the short version. Thank you. Uh, we have one other slide, which is actually uh, the questions we have for you in terms of the, uh, the, the issues for consideration and the, specifically the timing of the regulating plans, the methods and the criteria for sunsetting them, 
if you want to change them, and then the strategy for development. But I want, while we pull that up, I wanted to turn it over to Peter to just speak a little bit about the implementation. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to see all of you in person, by the way. Um, just to speak about next steps here, I think one of the critical things that I've always had um, on my mind uh, on behalf of the taxpayers and, um, you know, sort of advocating for, um, for what I'd suggest you consider here is um, grasping the right approach to capturing land value. Um, sooner rather than later uh, so that you can recuperate your investment, but also uh, retaining the ability to maximize uh, the sales proceeds to the county uh, over time. And, um, and that really uh, should take place um, in an orderly fashion uh, through an RFP process uh, that capitalizes upon an, a uh, sequential approach to phasing and development of the land. There's opportunity for public-private partnerships with private developers coming in uh, so that the taxpayers can participate. Uh, but certainly, there's an immediate possibility of actually liquidating uh, high-value parcels uh, pursuant to an RFP process now that we have the certainty of the zoning being adopted. The, uh, the greatest risk associated with this project is if a private developer comes in and they don't have confidence that they can actually build what they want to build. And so to be able to adopt the zoning and provide that level of certainty is, uh, is one way to maximize the dollars that the county taxpayers can achieve here. But the rest of this is to, to be patient about the disposition of the land. The, the way to minimize land value is to try to sell the whole thing at once. Uh, and so the objectives might be to recuperate the investment, but then uh, they could also be to maximize over time uh, through an orderly sale of the development parcels or participation in the cash flow of the development. So uh, I think you should be mindful about that. That would be my suggestion. Um, the other aspect of this is to consider the actual financial feasibility of building any component of this site and to really have a good handle on the land value. So what, we're, you know, what we've discussed thus far in the process has been concepts of what um, the land could, uh, could create in terms of value per acre, uh, but really land is worth what you can do with it. And so pursuant to the zoning being adopted and the certainty related to what a developer could come in and put on any, any one of these development parcels, that can be underwritten. There can be a development performer created, there can be a cash flow that would actually derive the land value that an investor ought to be paying you for the right to develop that property. To really have a good grasp of that is important. Um, the prior appraisals that have been done on the land have been all the sales comparison approach, and it's important for the income approach uh, to actually be deployed here so that you have a, a sophisticated view on a discounted cash flow basis of each block to this project so that before you go into negotiations pursuant to an RFP process with any private developer that you really have a handle on your own strong point of view on what the land is really worth and you can have that educated discussion with any private developer that wants to come in and either partner with you or just acquire the land. Um, the other thing that I would just mention is that um, you know, Urban 3's analysis of taxable value is quite conservative. Uh, and that's because of the fact that we're dealing with assessed values, their averages. Um, the way that this project is planned really promotes the idea that this could be, you know, any individual building here is really already set up to be institutional grade. And so these would be trophy acquisitions. These would be attracting investors from, uh, from Wall Street, from, you know, of course, regional investors, both on equity and debt. And so the profile of this development actually would mean that the investment value of what's created here uh, could have much higher taxable value. And so keep that in mind. And that just means that it's more consequential for you to really consider the financial feasibility, the actual land value, to be careful about selecting the development partners that are coming in. This is not a process where you just put a sign with a broker on Nine Mile Road and you know, wait for offers to come in. This should be orchestrated, and uh, I know you have a grasp of that. I just wanted to reemphasize how important that is to both recuperating in the, in the near term the investment and also uh, capturing the, the full value of the land um, you know, for the taxpayers. That, we're happy to take questions or talk a bit about the, these issues for consideration that we've put up. Um, yeah, um, and I and I appreciate everything that you've brought in the presentation today. Um, and I, going back to the slide that shows the the super uh, the value, if you could go back to that for just a minute, um, it was kind of like what the slides that you presented that showed downtown with the with the more intense uses generating. Oh, one more. Yeah. The, the more, yeah, that one there. Um, and in 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 the zoning there, if I'm if I'm not incorrect, where the biggest spike is that's where you were talking about five-story buildings being allowed but then you were talking about going to four-story with a fifth fifth floor being something that we could add value to um i guess hotels looking at what's allowed that would include hotels in that block 
Okay. It would also include commerce. I mean, you know, mm. the commerce can come down here as well. Okay. So that's something to think about. And then in, in the other slide that, that listed all the different uses, including the residential, uh, there was, uh, I believe, 238 that, were, that it talked about detached single family. Was that? That was on Mary Chell's. Yes. Yeah, so the pro you're talking about the program that you, she that she that we worked off. Yes. Which was 4,000 yes. jobs plus about um, 239. 239 okay. multifamily. That would be. Would that be the, ex the extreme northern portion, and that would be in the last phase, the last sunset period? Is that where those would go? No, this is that's multifamily, so that's towards the town center. For okay, the I'm sorry. I've, yeah. So where would the single family detached? Yeah, I think she's put that she's put that into the townhouse uh, category, townhouse and single family, the 179. Okay, all right. So so we're looking at if it's built out, the, what's the maximum number? Is it like 11, 1,200 well, so or so? It, you know, it depends how the plan flexes. Mm -hmm. According to Peter's analysis, it could go as high as 2,000 units or as low as right now we have just about a thousand, mm -hmm. so somewhere between a thousand and two thousand. That's how I would see it. And how did you all generate the the numbers of jobs? Um, it, it's just they, they're just nice, neat numbers. Is it just a calculation based on the square footage? Well, yeah. So you know, as you remember, you know, the, the jobs can come in a more compact form and could fit on f 50 acres, or it can come yep. in a slightly bigger form and could fit on 250 acres. Are these conservative estimates as well? Yeah, I think they're pretty conservative. I mean, we're very confident. You know, you have a lot of land here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, the more the more judicious you are about developing it compactly and in an orderly fashion, the more you're going to be able to recoup uh, some significant. Oh, returns. sure. And 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 the stuff that's going to sell the quickest is the residential. That's where people are going to make a quick buck. It's quick. It's amazing how quickly they can build a gigantic four or five story apartment complex and just turn it and, and turn it and burn it. Um, but remember, we have we've, we've constrained initially where the residential can go. Um, yeah, true. Yeah, true. But that—that's the stuff that's going to go quick. It's going to sure. be very, very um, fast. You know, the concern that I've got is, of course, the schools in the area are, are at capacity, and we are going to be. Hopefully, I'll be able to convince at least two others of this board that we need some sort of concurrency or some other funding mechanism to not just pay for the school, but the stormwater, the fire station, the additional fire personnel. I mean, this is a big. When you talk about 2,000 residential units, that's much more. Imp that's going to create much more of an impact to the community than 2,000 jobs would be, where they blow the whistle and they leave it and go back to where they yep. were. And that's why we began to think yesterday about the sort of a public benefit program, because in cities where we work around the country, where it's become desirable to build, as Beulah evidently is with the number of housing units that are coming here, um, you are in an in a enviable position of being able to, so, and because we are it's creating a new zoning category, mm -hmm. maybe we don't go to five stories right away, but you allow for four, and the trigger to five is for the extraction of whatever benefits you need, whether it's helping to, well, the school board is separate, and we have accounted for a school site in the yes, city I zone. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. But for all the other benefits you have, we saw the county's uh, um, roof, mm -hmm. the green roof, um, yeah. and, which is amazing. It's saving 30% in, 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 in costs. Um, it's something that, especially those who are going to provide the large building footprint, should really be looking to do. You know, as you start to think about how 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 environmentally sustainable the development can be, so to make it attractive for them, and to maybe give them a little more capacity, is something that should be thought about. Yeah, and then, and then the the final, and I'm, I apologize to uh, to take, but the uh, the future land use, I, I you know, I really um, in looking at that, I, I really prefer to wait on that. What would be the what would be the purpose of of pushing that right at the moment? Because um, it looks like uh, it almost seems reversed from what it ought to be. The majority of it mixed so, M MDU. It should be most of it should be commercial with a small portion for the high intensity. So the, the thing that I've seen with these future land uses, once you designate it, you got to go through a pretty significant process to, to pull it back. And there's a and what I've seen is citizens get very, very active and can make, I mean, so I say that to say this, of course, citizens have a process, but that's why I want to, that's why I want to get it right the first time. So why, why the press to do this now? Well, because it's right now, and I would ask for the, for John maybe to, to clarify for me, but I, as I understand it, before you put the zoning in place, the, the, the flu has to be in place because right now it's zone P, which sure. means public. So, so it, it does have to change. Uh, I, I understand that, but I guess what I'm saying is the, the, the the, the parcels that are going to move quick are the residential, right? We know that. So perhaps we put the MUU um, or we put whatever the, your new designations are, and then the rest of it we leave it commercial because commercial is not going to allow them to build a bunch of apartments, right? And then we could have control as a board 
Um, we had that issue on Pine Forest Road. It was, it was not, the future land use was not, was, was zoned commercial and they couldn't build the apartment. And it was a big issue. It created a lot of consternation. So what would be, what would be the harm in doing it that way? Because that's the way I'm going to try and, and move it. I, as, I, as I understand it, and John also correct me if I'm wrong, but the commercial uh, does constrain, is, 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 is subservient, for lack of a better word, uh, the residential is subservient under Absolutely. the commercial designation. Yes. And so we like that. You, yeah, you, you, we like that. You Investors like that. don't. Developers don't. Yeah. So I, I, if you want to build the town center the way we've shown it, which is retail on the ground floor and then maybe multifamily above, that's not 25% residential. It's got a higher percentage. And the commerce restricts the amount of residential that can come mm -hmm. as, a, as a proportion of the amount of commercial development that's there. The most valuable, and I apologize again, I'm taking a lot of time here, but this, we're not going to have this discussion tonight. Can you go to that slide that shows the, the heart of that town center? Because I believe that is the most, yeah, what you would say, the most marketable, go valuable. The, go to the plan, Mike, right? The, the so one there. is it block yeah. 21? What, what? It's that area right there. Right there. Yeah. So what would be the harm? I mean, that's the stuff that's going to recoup our 18 million, right? We've already recouped 4 million from Navy Federal, so we got 14 more million we got to recoup. How many acres does that represent? Is that like 30, 31. 31 acres? And, and what designation would you need to, to get the highest level of whatever you want to build their four stories so that we could recoup our investment? So the zoning we've given it is what we've called neighborhood core, and we are not tied yeah, to the number. No, I understand, but the future land use, I'm the, sorry. Oh, the future land use, we put it as MUU, MUU. because it can do, it, you can get commerce there if you want. It doesn't preclude commerce, but mm -hmm. it also allows you to do the five stories yes, of, of residential. And that's, that's kind of the direction I'd like to go. There's no rush. We're not going to rush. I mean, I'm certainly not in a rush. I know the residents out there aren't in a rush. They don't, most of them would like to see nothing built there, to be very honest. Of course, we know that's not realistic, and I've said that over and over like a broken record. But what would be the harm in getting the future land use locked down for that parcel, that 31 acres? Because that's, again, that's what's going to sell the quickest. And then we can always quickly move if we bring in an Amazon or a Google or a big um, uh, a big tenant for the retail or for the for the commerce par, uh, parcel part. What would be the what would be the harm in doing it that way? Well, I think the I think you could you could certainly parcel of. I mean, I, I presume you could leave some parts of the of the future land use P Public, yeah. and just carve out what you want to do as you use it. But I think I would go beyond the town center a little bit because whoever whatever retail comes in there, whether it's commerce yep. or retail, they still want a bit of residential. And you're right, the residential would come in. But since residential is constrained in the mm -hmm. first phase and it can only go north of that where the yellow is on the plan, mm -hmm. um, I would be allowing for for that as well. I and mean, we could certainly carve out. Um, if we go to the zoning, the regulating plan one, yeah, you could, if, if you can see Mike's arrow, we could carve out a portion of where, what would make you all comfortable in terms of what you can do right away. And you know, some industries are going to wait for the, um, are going to wait for the interchange to come in, but sure. some, some, you know, Scott Luth maybe have, has some people who are interested in the site right away who could come in to, um, so maybe you do the, you do the, 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 the south east quadrant. Mm -hmm. So you can zone what Z4, you can zone some Z5, and then the, the, the rest of the three, well, the other one is actually civic. So you could do half of it right away and then hold the rest for later. Um, Horace, can, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. So if we, if we did this in stages, we know where the valuable land is. Where, I mean, everyone knows, everyone knows, right? And it's that area, and we do the future land use for that area. How long would it take for the board to get the future land use designation for that area? Well, um, there's something that was just passed in the legislation this year that says that basically they moved the small scale map of the amendment process with the board control only, they moved that up to, I think, 50 or 100 acres. So with that being said, that basically with large scale, if it's over 10 acres, it has to go to Tallahassee, stay within Tallahassee for about three months, four months, and that could be a delay in this. Mm -hmm. But with that legislation that was just passed, if the governor signs it into law, mm -hmm. basically, the board, it don't, it, with, with, it, with the increase of acreage, it doesn't have to go to Tallahassee. It still got to go through the process with the planning board. But the board can bless it. And if the board make a recommendation, it can be signed and sealed that night or the next night whenever the board make a recommendation. But that's if the governor signs it? Yes. Do, do we anticipate? I, well, the legislation, I don't know. But I know it's passed both houses, and I know it's waiting for his signature. OK, then that means he will probably sign. Um, so. You're saying that this parcel, the purple that we're looking at right now, we could 
the board, because that's obviously more than 50 acres, we, the board could designate it, the future land use, however we would like, without sending it to Tallahassee? If it meet that acreage requirement, yes, sir. Oh, and the acreage requirement is more than 50 acres? I think, I think it's 50 acres or, I think it's up to 100. I think it's up to 100, but they gave us, a, they gave, I think it's up, up to 100 acres. Up to 100. The, yes. Okay. Yes. All right, so we could do 31 acres if that Absolutely. passed. Yes, and, and, okay, conservatively, three-month process? Three months? Um, if Six it, months? Same as the rezoning. If, okay. If we meet the acreage requirement, the board blesses it, mm -hmm. it is done, and it's signed and delivered. Okay. Right then. Imagine that we've done that, and we've, we've done it, we, we've put it all mixed-use urban, and, oh, no, we want to come back and we want to make it, you know, something different because we have an investor that wants to come do some commercial. Um, and, but we've already done the future land use. Is it the same in reverse, or does that part allow the public to come in and have hearings? I mean, I want to get this right the first time. Yes, and when I say get it right, I mean, we're going to make the decision. Yes, sir. It, it will yet require the planning board action with the with public hearings, which has got to come back to the board. It yet going to require that. That's, that's, that's just the growth management laws. Okay. It's still going to require planning board and public hearings. Yes. But nothing additional, nothing more than what we're doing to requirement, the board blesses it okay it does have to go to Tallahassee okay thank you well those are my questions and and I appreciate you guys finishing up your work and bringing the deliverable thank you thank you uh board of the, I have a couple questions but I want to okay um on the um on the school or did 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 we ex um you know there were some requirements that the school district said they needed were those accommodated well, you know, we told them, we were trying to encourage them. Yeah, they, you know, they typically need 25 acres. You can do schools on 10 acres. You know, this is the one school in Beulah that could be walkable to some households. Um, yeah, so we, we know schools around the country are doing them on 12 acres, 10 acres. So we would encourage you to consider, or encourage them, I should say, to encourage a more compact model. But, but it, it's, uh, fundamentally, it's up to them, and we have the land I mean, is, is there, well, it's up to right, but, but is, there, is there a requirement from the state that they be a certain acreage? No, I, that, I mean that's what they. I think that's yeah. what they indicated to us, right? Yeah, they said they would like 25 acres. I said, could you do it on 15? Talking to Sean Dennis, he said, well, we'd rather not. What they want is they want facilities for athletics and stuff. It's a duplicative effort. If maybe federal's going to have them there, perhaps the county. That's right. I think there's some ways we can eliminate that need for their acreage. <coughs> you know, we'll locate some facilities. Okay. Um, and then also, um, you know, I, I, not speaking on your behalf, but. Um, you know, I, I think um, something that's really helped the beach is is really drilling down into permitted uses, and and uh, you know, and I think there have been certain things that you've you've definitely not wanted, um, and so I would, I, in looking at the permitted uses, do, are those addressed well, adequately? And, and again, and this is their deliverable. This is not what we're right. putting forward. And, and I mean, so they're they're giving their deliverable. We're accepting it, and then this board's going to have a big discussion about, and some stuff's going to change. That's my prediction, but it's going to be very, very similar to what you've provided. But again, that's one of many issues that I have, and, um, and I assume we'd have a big conversation. Yeah, because there's not going to be tattoo studios. There's not going to be smoke shops. That's not going to be there, right? If I can get two additional right. votes. So, <laughs> we I mean, so or do, we, do we want to go ahead and, and try to include? I don't think right now we're going to make that sausage. We're accepting their deliverable today. Okay. Deliverable. And we've already made a few changes to the uses based on our conversations with um, city uh, county staff yesterday. And the day before. Okay. Well, very, well I appreciate. I, and again, I think um, I think we still have a little bit of work left with transportation and stormwater is what I was hearing. Um, and so, um, but it, um, you know, I, I think I, actually the the one thing I, I would have is is again with um, of course we do have that one big arrow coming right down into nine mile. Um, and and with the um, the project that's going on right now, I just want to make sure that that doesn't adversely impact the work that's currently being done, and that there there's adequate. Um, Whereabouts on, on right Bell Ridge? Or which which main road? Is that Bell Ridge? Is or is that no, no. This is this is coming in from the that uh, what, slide is it, 28 is uh, stormwater management. Oh, okay. Right there. Yes. So this arrow at the bottom goes right into Nine Mile. So I would just want to make sure, I don't know what infrastructure we already have in place or, or, or necessarily what the state's added. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's going to be your, um, 
you know, this is your core area, so this is probably going to be where you have the, the most impervious, impervious surfaces, right? So, um, my concern would, would just be that, that I mean, I'm, that, that's just, no, well, nothing about stormwater, but just looking at just one big arrow from, from that one I area mean, these going, are, going to nine mile. Um, that's a big, that's a very good point because these are all residential neighborhoods right to the south of nine mile road. But I would say, you know, these are the pretty pictures. The stormwater engineer is going to come in and, and do what they do. And they're going to say, guys, this won't work. It looks pretty, but we're going to put the arrows going into the wetlands that are already there. Right. So, um, I share your concerns cause I, I live right across the street there and sure, uh, there's hundreds of houses. So we certainly don't want stormwater to be more of a problem than it is already for everyone, but I do appreciate that. And, but and the stormwater engineers come in behind these right. guys. And then the zoning maps are, are just something that, that are being recommended and, and we can, um, I, I think as we, as we initially discussed that there could be some, um, you know, it would just come in front of the board to make a decision on, on if we go uh, where their current route or if we go ahead and make the switch or something like that. So um, I think that's probably just something we we talk That's about hard. so yeah okay well thank you any other uh, commissioner yeah. may yes thank you, Chairman. And, and peter just um if you had to put a valuation on the entire property today what, what would it be worth i think we had quantified it just as a really high level range of anywhere between 30 and 60 million dollars depending upon you know what the actual adopted zoning was you know uh, but that's to sell it sort of in over a period of a couple years in big chunks um, the value could be a lot higher um, if it was sold over a longer period of time in smaller chunks. Um, and so it's, you know, part of this dialogue is really what, what are your objectives? You know, if you, want to, if you want to simply recuperate the investment and then hold the remainder of the land for potential economic development purposes, that's one avenue. The other approach is, you know, recuperate the investment and then continue in a, in a strategic way to dispose of the land, um, yes, holding on to commerce components for a long time, but in an orderly fashion, selling off in a really smart way sequentially, smaller development parcels. That's how you'll actually maximize the value because there's actually a discount on a per acre basis for scale. Mm -hmm. So smaller parcels are more valuable per, per acre. And so to do this block by block, that's really the way to, to maximize the return to the taxpayers. So Jeff, that, is that kind of where you're going to Absolutely. Our investment. Yeah, let's get our money back quick and yes. be strategic. I like yeah. that approach. Right. Yeah. No, that's why. I, no, no, I appreciate your expertise. And and Jeff, that's where I am. I mean, you know, sure. long term. I mean, the citizens that pay taxes. I mean, they'll be dead and in their grave on, on the long term. I mean, I often say that about Jim Crowley. Before this could really make money, Jim wouldn't even be around. I mean, and neither would I. I mean, but I but I can tell you this, and I'm with you, Lumen, on that. But I can tell you this: that 31 acres there, we we get that zoning 60 units per acre. Mm -hmm. Guys like Fred Hammer here in the audience, they're going to be salivating over that. That's going to be expensive res expensive property that we're going to recoup our money very, very quickly. Yeah. And my strong recommendation very with that would be that you you follow an RFP process that's totally professionally orchestrated. I and mean, take a look at West we Main have Street. To. We have to. We have 27 respondents for the West Main Street RFP. Yeah. So, and, that, and that's your recommendation, because I, I concur yeah. with my counterpoint that I want to immediately get, I don't know what we have, 18 million in this deal, Jeff? I don't we know. We have 14 now. Yep. Wait, 14? We got four from Navy Federal. Four from Navy Federal. Okay. Peter, you're the expert. That 31 acres, if it's zoned for 60 dwelling units per acre, mixed use, I mean, wide open, that's going to get our money back, isn't it? it, it Is that what well, you're recommending, Peter? Yeah. 31 acres. Yeah, that's, that's where you can start. That's the quickest hit. Um, you know, particularly if you handle this and market it the right way, it, you have the zoning adopted. Part of that is also that any developer that comes into the 31 acres wants to know what's happening on the rest of the site, at least on the margins sure. of what they're acquiring. Well, and now they know. So now they know. yeah, right. And so I think um, you know any greater certainty, um, a strategic mindset toward the vision for the entire site adopted by the county. To some degree, you know, you should have a vision that you're communicating to developers that you're trying to sell the land to. It's not just we're holding all of this for whatever happens in the future. It's and we're selling only this parcel. There's an order to this, right? So I think that that's the right approach to maximize the responsiveness to an RFP process for that. So and we all know, and I know you guys are involved somewhat at the Main Street property yep. here, and that didn't plan out the way it was almost intended to plan out. Uh, and you said something that kind of piqued my interest in that we don't just put out an RFP. For a real estate company, we yeah. find a 
develop, explain that just a little more? Well, I think there are a couple of approaches you could take. I mean, you, you could sell individual parcels to individual developers that take down each parcel of land, or you could identify a master developer that's charged with master developing the entire site and is in this for the long term. I think the, the challenges with the West Main Street uh, process was not in the idea that that location and those parcels and the plan was marketable, it was. That's why you had 27 respondents to that RFP. The issue was the complications when it got to the city council. And so you have an opportunity here to, to not and, right. have that and process play out the same way. And that's why I want to get your expertise way. advice yeah. because you may be off the clock after today and we don't want those same problems here yeah. at the county commission that they might have had at the city and, council. And you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you as, as this goes forward, we all are. I mean, we, we have a stake in the outcome here too. We want to see this be developed as an economic engine for the county. Um, and uh, we believe in it, and this is a great parcel of land, and it's a great opportunity for the taxpayers. So I think being really thoughtful about how this is orchestrated so that we are um, achieving the most professional uh, and thoughtful and uh, accretive responses to an RFP process for the 31 acres, but really also for all subsequent um, you know, parcels that are being offered for, for development. You know, that's an important feature to this. I mean, you, it's, um, you're not going into this blindly. You've, you've invested so far in this process, but it doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop with the zoning. It continues. And so I would just encourage you to continue to think about a rigorous process that identifies opportunities that, um, that um, you know, allows for a collaborative relationship with developers on what should be built and what could be built and where the value is um, so that you know, the county is well served here. And, but I mean, we, we would set, set a minimum value or evaluation of the property before we put out the RFP. It just wouldn't be, or would you leave it open-ended for a development? I think you should have a strong point of view on what you believe the land is worth that, that is the subject of any RFP. Um, but it's all subject to negotiation to some degree. And in fact, it might, you might find that there's so much of a strong appetite because in fact, there's a lot of capital right now that's interested in the Pensacola area. Um, you know, I have clients that call me from New York that don't know that I've done so much work in Pensacola and they say, hey, we're looking at a project in Pensacola. And it's a big surprise to them to know that I, I know this market pretty well at this point. So um, there's a lot of interest here. And I so think what's that your response you might be surprised. What's your response? <laughs> is it, is right. it fair so, so my response to, to the question well, really I is. Am I on retainer? <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think that, um, you know, to follow a rigorous process here, um, you know, maximizes the value for, for whatever the outcome is here. You're adopting the zoning now and to have a strategy related to the land disposition, as I think is the next exercise. What do you want this to look like in terms of, of disposing of this land? What do you want to hold on to? You know, what are your near-term and long-term financial objectives? And then to orchestrate a disposition strategy that, that addresses that. Can I just add one little thing to what Peter said about West Main? Because I think the other, the other thing we learned through the West Main process is that um, even though there were, there were more rigorous um, regulations attached to the property, the, the predictability and the consistency yes. of what needed to be done for the developers was huge because they knew that they were going to be held to the same standards as the next one that comes into. So to have, you know, they, so that they, you don't want people coming in wanting to opt out of, of, certain idea, of certain things. So the fact that there's going to be a code, however you finalize it, that is adopted, that's in place, that is attached to the RFP. And when the RFP went out to West Main, they attached the additional regulations as well that were attached to it. So that the, the developers know, okay, we're gonna be held to a high standard, but so is everybody else who's coming in here as well. Um, we'll, we'll also help remove that level of, um, of, of distinction, which is, which is important to the process. The, the greater level of leadership you all can show to the development community in terms of providing that level of certainty, investment security, is going to be what attracts the capital here. So th that's a really important thing to, to communicate that vision and have it be comprehensive in nature. Perfect. Anything else from the board? Commissioner. Yes, sir. If I may, I'd like to be clear with the record so that there's no surprises for you all. Um, that that's helps. That's my task, to make that, sure that there's helps, no course. surprises that helps. for you all. I'd like to be clear. Um, now, at the planning board meeting Monday, staff did, we did present the future land use map, as you saw on the, on the scene. And the planning board did make a recommendation only for that to be as depicted on the screen. July the 8th, it is scheduled to come back for the initial hearing at that time. If there's any changes that you want to be made, I will have to work with the legal department to see if you can make it at that meeting or that if it has to go back to 
the planning board with, with, with GPZ, go back, to the, go back to the planning board. I would be working with legal on that because I don't know if you can make it at that meeting or it gotta go back. I want to be clear with that. That is a consent item on the agenda today for July the 8th. Also too, I wanna be clear with the record again. Um, I just think that I'm glad for Kia. Uh, House Bill 487, she sent me this. It says that it's currently, it, is, it has not been signed by the governor and it, and it will increase the maximum acreage of small scale comp plan amendments from 10 acres to 50 acres, 50. okay? And increase the acreage in a rural area of opportunity from 20 acres to 100 acres. So I guess it would be deciding on how Tallahassee would view that project as a real area of rural opportunity, 100 acres. If not, it'll be 50 acres. 50 acres. Okay. So I want to be clear with the record so you'll be clear Thank with you, your Lawrence. information. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry, Horace, I didn't understand what you said, buddy. What, can we, can you come back up? I didn't Absolutely. understand what you said. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what is the, what's on July 8th that's coming Ju to us or it's going to the planning board? July the 8th, the, we, we had the, the, the future land use, the proposed future land use map. If someone could pull up on the screen, you'll be able to see it. The, yes, that map, that's the proposed future land use map. Okay. The planning board made a recommendation for that map to come before you with, with the comp plan text to come to July the 8th for the initial hearing is on the consent agenda under the GMR. Is it gonna be on the agenda on the 17th to schedule for the 8th, is that what you're saying? Because, yes. is it on the agenda today? I thought we just had the cancellation. It's the on the, it says, it says right here. It says, um, it's on the consent agenda, the so first of two public hearings. What number is that? Uh, on the 547. So this cancellation of the public hearing. No, but that's this is the consent agenda for. Okay, let me make sure. Is the consent agenda? Let, let, let me let me let me be. John, what is it again, John? Yeah. Is it? So yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It has to be. It will be consented on what time? time? On the 17th. Yes, on the 17th. Okay. So you're planning on it being on the consent agenda for the 17th to be on the our agenda on the 8th. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. All right, so it's not going back to the planning board. No, it's not. Okay. It's not all right. going and back we can, to the planning board at all. And they That's made a recommendation. Good. However, when it comes to us, we can do whatever we want with what we see on the screen. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That's kind of what I'd like to Thanks. Commissioner May. Um, no, I was just getting a clarification from from from, from, Thanks, from All right. Hart. Thank you. But, Mr. Chairman, I will say, uh, Commissioner Berry, I, th I, I think. Um, there was nobody on this board other than you and I uh, when we went, first started this. And when Peter said, you know, 30 to 60 minimum and with great opportunity, uh, this is not a bad investment. Uh, it's worked out. Yeah, it's worked out. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a labor of love and a labor of much scrutiny and criticism and those things, but, right. you know. So at, at the end of the day, we were good stewards because we could sell this today, Peter, for 30 or $60 million and recoup the $14 million and move on. So Correct. that's not a bad investment. And so, sure. Uh, I'll be back into it. I'll take it. All right. And I mean, there are some people, Jeff, that I think and end up and, and end up with a bunch of proper, a bunch of taxable value on the rolls, yeah. uh, you know, jobs, jobs on the property. Jobs, I mean, other yeah. things, uh, other than the public money that we put out that we did expend, there'd be, you know, there'd be, there'd, you know, there'd be many, uh, many types of residual revenue coming from it year after year after year from the property from that decision as well. Yes. All right, the multiplier. Yes. And, and Jeff, I, I think you would probably <coughs> join me in this, and I, I know it before we were even elected, uh, there were people like Admiral Kelly and Jim Cronley who had 20, 30 year visions yes. of this. And you know, I don't think of any greater contribution that those guys had than to be visionaries uh, uh, for this property. And I mean, a lot of kudos. I mean, regardless of your political position, and I know there's been a lot of a negative talk from this dies and accusations at, at certain citizens and individuals. Uh, but these gentlemen's vision uh, has gotten a great ROI uh, for sure this has. county. I mean, Commissioner Perry just said, I mean, we could sell it for 60 or 100 million uh, and we could also get Avalon taxes, create Absolutely. jobs and create a better quality of life for the citizens. So to me, that's a win. I mean, I'm sure that to Jim Cronley deserves a ton of respect 
and a ton of gratitude from the citizens because not only what you just said, but think about over in Santa Rosa County, what we've done for the region, keeping that training mission and all those helicopter pilots at Whiting. And he went out there and expended over $100,000 to get the mineral rights to make OLFX happen. I'll be honest, it was a roller coaster ride. I got on this board, we were making big decisions, millions of dollars in cost overruns. But now, looking where we're at now, it was because someone had vision and we stuck with this board stuck with them. Right. And, and now that Whiting training mission, um, they do more sorties, shorter flying distance, gas savings. The Navy loves it. They got a first class field. We keep the training mission here. It's not gonna, it's not gonna go get bracked to somewhere else. And now we've got this field, we've got the value of real estate compromise, right? We've got a compromise, we're gonna have some mixed use and you know everyone's gonna get a win out of it. Yeah. And Everyone, Jeff, no, thank you, Jeff, for, for coming along. I mean, you were not here. I'm happy you, to be here. But your leadership, but uh, as you just so eloquently stated, uh, when you look at the cradle of aviation, the military, yes. which is, um, you know, our bedrock, uh, a partnership there, a partnership with Navy Federal, one of our largest employers, Absolutely. and a partnership with our private developers, as well as with local government. Uh, that's really how it should work. And to me, this is one of those you know, great regional stories that should be shared. So I, I hope that that message is conveyed. And uh, I'm sure our PIO is listening, and I see Jim's probably here. And um, I hope that this story is shared with citizens because this was a win for Escambia County. And it's just starting, man. Yeah, and there's going to there's gonna be some of those folks that are still here to enjoy it, you know, Admiral Kelly and, and, and you know, Jim Cronley especially. But if you saw some of the, you know, some of the notes that, um, that were shared years ago, um, you know, some of the public documents that were shared, there were, there were other people that were part of some of those conversations that, that you know, are no longer here. I, I specifically, um, there was a, a gentleman that's, uh, you, know, a, uh, you know, from one of the, you know, very influential families in, in my district, Willard Brown, um, who, you know, founded Instrument Control Services, as well as a number of other businesses, uh, you know, the, the children, he's, he's been deceased 12, 14 years, but, you know, the children are running the businesses now. There are a couple of them that are out of Ellison Field. Um, but Willard was part of those initial discussions that go back to 97, 98, 99 in those time frames. And, uh, you know, so it's fortunate that as long a process as it, as it has been, there are going to be some of those folks that are able to see that are able to really see this this success come to fruition complete you know the complete circle so that that's great for them and i hope as as time goes on we're you know we um you know take the appropriate steps to acknowledge uh, to acknowledge those folks because there was a lot of you know a lot of trips uh you know paid for out of pocket a lot of trips to dc a lot of those things a lot of lobbying efforts on on the public's behalf that um, um that didn't have to happen by any means well, and, and I think we have influence on that, Commissioner Barry. They're going to be naming rights, and I mean, it's outlined Bill 8 now, but there's going to be opportunities for how we name that Commerce Park or how we name that development. And I think we probably should be mindful and you know, certainly open for recommendations from our consultants on how do we move forward to brand that for the next generation. So appreciate y'all being here. Yeah, maybe Santa Rosa can repay us by sending us some leads on some economic development. <laughs> Oh, they're killing us right now. They're, I mean, they're good. Yeah. They, they, yeah, I'm they glad got, we made it so good for them. Spots. We yeah. should at least get some royalties or something. So, <laughs> hey, Horace, stay right there. Let's go ahead and do GMR while you're right, yeah. right there. So, well, all right. Thank you uh, so much. Thanks. You said that, Robert. I often say we create jobs for tourists who live in Santa Rosa and Okaloosa County. I mean, we got to create jobs for people that live in Escambia County. That's, That's right. you know, period. I mean, we got to hire people that live in Escambia County. All right, Horace. A commissioner also too, D DPZ will be here the rest of the day. Um, if there's, they can be, we're trying to see if they can be, get office here or they'll be at COC. So if there's anyone for- like they're headed on Well, out. I'm glad they're going okay. to tell my good friends at Baptist that that development in my district is very important. So I'm glad that they're, they'll convey that message today. So they're trying to find a room either oh, here or on, they're going to be at COC. Yes, Marina. Do we need to be back tonight or not? No. Okay. I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Depends on how successful you are at Baptist today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Horace, go ahead. Yes, sir. The, the GMR report, and maybe you can take all three of these items in one motion. Uh, item one, two, and three basically have all are canceled. All canceled, yep. Okay. So, let me see. Also, too, and we do have the GMR action item. Um, this is just an update of what the what the development services has been doing for the previous year. Okay. 
And then your consent agenda. Then I will consent agenda. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, going back to the uh, clerk and comptroller's report. Thank you. I have two items on the agenda. One has to do with the investment report provided to you, details backing up. Um, the other one is a routine item that is just the minutes and reports prepared by the clerk to the board's office. I would like to share with you the May TDT numbers. Those came in at a million five. The exact number is one million five ninety four one thirty. If you're comparing apples to apples, that was probably about three hundred and eighteen thousand per penny. Now we have five pennies, which would be about a twenty five percent over twenty nineteen. I did the quick calculations. It'll come on next month's report, but I thought you might be interested in it. No, that's uh, good to hear. Thank you for sharing. So it looks like that would have been um, apples to apples about a one point two seven five collection is that what you're saying if it, if it had just been the four cents right yep. you would take out the 318 yep. correct yep. okay so still a, a great um month of uh it was april april in april correct if so, the way the collections without fall, the bridge and a number of hotels still being out right the way the collections fall the reports and when the right. money's due and the deadlines for the agenda it just it's, doesn't line up doesn't so i'd like to you. just give it to you so it's not stale information you're we appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, Madam Attorney, do you have anything on the written communication or any comments? Or? If the board wants, I can I can run through it. I think that. Uh... Uh, colleagues, I, I don't have an issue with it. It is, in, it is in District 5, I believe. I don't I don't have an issue with the request, and I'll state that this evening unless uh, there's questions. Sounds good to me. Okay. I, I, my only question was, what's the status of the other property? If, uh, if he's passed, is it going to her or, you know? Um, the it, other property. It, what do you mean, other property? The the one that it the, the uh, attached. West Ensley Street. Yes, the three, I don't believe the she has any okay interest in that. Okay, it's it's presented as she has no interest or no future interest. Okay, but that, all right, perfect. Okay. Uh, all right, County Administrator's report. Um, I'll just go through this real quick. Um, uh, car one, one uh, uh, recommendation concerning CRA meeting minutes. Uh, recommendation two concerning certi certification of local government approval for ESG applying nonprofit organizations. Three recommendation concerning renewal of an agreement between Career Source Escarosa and the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Four recommendation concerning Career Source Escarosa Fourth Amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding with the Skimmy County School District. Five, recommendation concerning consent for Morris Court. Three, unsecured loan request. Six, recommendation concerning the request of disposition of property for the Public Works Department. Seven, disposition of property for public safety. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, can we talk about seven for just a second? It doesn't need to be held for tonight, but there's hundreds, there's hundreds of items on there, which is fine, and, it, and I'm good with disposing of things that we don't have a need for, but I mean, there's a there's a, a bunch of technology, a bunch of laptops and stuff like that. Is there not something that we, I mean, we have, you know, we have many nonprofits that we partner with on many different levels. Is there not a way to scrub the to scrub those laptops and at least offer them to some of our nonprofit partners rather than whatever our plans are to do with the the equipment itself? Uh, Bart, do you want to? I mean. Do both of you, I guess. And I think it's pretty much what we've done in the past. I know. Or at least we've talked about it. Before. I know. Well, before you got on the board, we successfully did it some, and then. What are you saying? Well, <laughs> no, that it. it, it <laughs> yeah, we, then we had turnover, and then all of a sudden the discussion becomes, well, there's no, we we can't do anything with these computers because there's stuff on them. Well, I mean, I've got, still, I've got a, maybe a half dozen to eight or nine. That are still being used by a nonprofit in Cantonment that were given to them in 2013 or 2014, you know, many years ago. Sure. I mean, people, in my opinion, many people can make use of, of stuff that we see as as out as as obsolete because they're not working with base residual revenue that comes in every year, and they don't have a schedule for replacement of items. They have to go raise money to replace items, and, and I, I just hope that somebody is making the effort that recognizes the board, in my opinion, the board would want to do that if there's any possible way that 
that we can do it. May I interject for a minute? I don't sure. think this is what this item is about, and I'm not looking at the full backup, but the laws changed as to what is considered a fixed asset. The threshold moved from $1,000 to 5000 This is not a disposition like getting rid of because of obsolescence. This is a disposition to reclass it. It just it becomes an expense item anymore and not a tracked item. However, I would tell you that Bart tracks his own computers through his own spreadsheets as opposed to something that goes formally on your books. Correct me if I'm wrong. It specifically says for removal from the inventory. That's all you're doing. You're removing it from your fixed asset inventory. These words have a very specific meaning in our world and probably not your world. Probably could have been worded a little bit differently, but she did reference the $5,000, and this was talked about with all the departments. So my apologies for not thinking her world, my world, your world, but you are not getting rid of these items. You are merely doing your accountability right. different. The, the, uh, narrative, the narrative is identical to items on the agenda in the past for years where I we would be that. disposing of items. I was okay. thinking it differently because I know what it's about and did not read it literally. So we'll make sure that we differentiate for um, depreciation versus getting rid of, right. so, okay. So these computers are standing? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. I probably wouldn't use the word disposition in the in the item on the agenda then. Well, we'll make sure we clear it up. So I, I, but that's also yeah, your that items don't run through me for clarification of narrative, but we've been talking about it, so I knew what it was. All right. Well, I, I can but help you with this. You did bring up something there, Madam Clerk. What, what, what were you talking about with Bart, about his computers? What, 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 what process do your computers not go through? So they, what, what she was talking about is we don't have a, it's not a spreadsheet. We have a product called Manage Engine that manages all our managed tickets and everything. It also accumulates data for all of our, anything that's on our network, it collects information so that we can track all of our devices, what, you know, where they're located. So if one, you've called up and say one's dead or I've lost one, we can actually see where it is on the network and go find it and replace it if it needs to be replaced. Is that a new thing or is that something? No, we've had that for way before I got here. That's been okay. here many years. Um, to your question about the devices, um, what I would tell you is most of our devices are eight to 10 years old, um, especially uh, in very bad shape. Um, because of where we are today in the security world, we, we, we basically take the hard drives out and we take the memory out so we can reuse it to upgrade any other systems that we may have. So if we give it to somebody, they can actually go buy a new computer cheaper than they can doing all of buying a hard drive and everything else. So it's, we, we are trying to partner with certain people when, if we have a device that is good enough to give out, but right now the devices we're moving are in such bad shape, they wouldn't want them in the first place. It's just not okay. a very good machine. All right. Well. Unless my colleagues disagree with me, I hope you're approaching the disposition of any of these items with the intent that the board has that anything that could be reused that has any value to a partner, we would like that to be reused rather than disposed of. To, to that point, so for public safety, we just replaced all of their devices. So the, the devices that were in the back of the trucks were all falling apart. So we replaced all of those. But the tablets that were in the fire stations, we are working with Terra right now. We've got to get take them through the asset, get them out of our assets, mm -hmm. and then those devices were still in good enough shape to where we think we can get to either resell or, or whatever the board wants us to do. If y'all want us to donate them to somebody, but they're they're a tablet, not a full blown PC. That would be the only challenge. Stephen, I, I think what might be a good process, and this is a great conversation because we did this when I was on the school district, and same kind of issues. There was a cost associated with before we scrapped the computers. There was a cost associated with scrubbing them and getting them to a point where they could be donated but it was a if i remember it was a minimal cost and we were able to do that with some of our faith-based partners and right. uh, some of the other uh, private schools we were able to give them the technology but what what happened was they would come forward to the board with a list of stuff and and then the board would have the option of what they would like to do and if you it sounds as though you're you're cannibalizing for lack of a better word this exactly. stuff for our use which is great i think there would be no disagreement that you got to do that first but like you said, these, these tablets, any, any kind of issues like that where you have them, it, that would be a great thing to put on the agenda. Right. Or, you know, we've got this, here are some organizations, um, what's your input? Because I'm sure uh, Stephen, myself, and the rest of the board members here would like to uh, be able to help some of our, uh, you know, faith-based organizations and other par community partners who could use that stuff. So yeah. if you could bring that forward, right. kind of like a reverse scrap, you know, right. these are still good, uh, they have some value, do you want to auction them off for a buck or could we 
you know, is that something that you could do? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's what, and that's what we're going to do with the tablets. All right. And, and look, the plan is once we get out of eight to 10 year old devices and get them to where we're doing a five year refresh, mm -hmm. a five year old machine, we could then give to partners and sure. things like that. They're still usable. It's the problem right now is getting a, an eight to 10 year old device that's falling apart and barely making it work right now. And giving it to somebody isn't worth it. I can. I'd rather help them go buy a two hundred dollar device from Dell or Walmart or right. something like that. That would be a smarter path than taking spending two hundred dollars on a on a hard drive that's on a on a ten year old machine. Just so, doesn't make sense. So usable stuff that I mean, and I use that term. I mean, something that uh, an organization, a nonprofit could use. You'll you'll bring those forward and separate from the disposition. Definitely. Oh yeah. Definitely. Okay. Not a problem. I think that's what Stephen was. I, I think that makes sense. Thanks. And, 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 and Jeff and. and I think Bart, when he first got on, we were able to do something with um, some community centers and some things like that. Yeah. But we do have, um, and, and that was pretty successful. I don't know how right. those machines were, but I know that they were very. Yeah, the Chromebooks and that we had some Toshiba tablets that HR had had and we were going to dispose of them and we gave them out to a couple of, uh, uh, yeah, the, you know two, the groups, they were, yeah, yeah. You know, gave us direction. Yeah, no, but that was, it was good. But I would say, Jeff, also not only those organizations, but our community centers are filled with Absolutely. children who, yeah. you know, um, don't have access to computers. So, I and mean, I, even up in the North End, um, Steve, with what they do up in Carver, and even what uh, Leroy does in Ebonwood and Brownsville, yep. we just have a boatload of uh, uh, poor children yeah. uh, that and, throughout the summer. And don't I would have anticipate, computers. Lumen, before it would even come to us, that would be f before it would come to us. In other words, check all of our assets that, first. That, that, thank you. Yeah, and so, yeah. so and so when it comes to us, you've already checked at all the community centers and all of our. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. what I was trying to get to. Thank you. That's you cut right. yep. the chase. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, just, okay. Commissioner Bender, yes, ma'am. One point to on. Madam Attorney. Eric. Just wanted her to know that these are considered fully depreciated, and we're doing it this way to not to invoke a prior period adjustment. So you will see this kind of item again year after year until we get the fixed asset inventory cleared off. But Tamika understands now what her wording should be in this item. And Clarification. So on that, real quick though, um, it sounds like it was changed at the state level so will yes, we be seeing this it's for law. countywide or? it's in state statute we have ways that we can do it at the county level we've been working with your departments to do that we knew you had a separate inventory system which you have to do sensitive items like guns they will stay on your inventory sure. items we do not let those go into a departmental inventory well um so that i mean that my seems like the same thing would be with with laptops though um, um, Bart, I'm assuming we're still tracking these though. Yes. And, and not. You are in his system. Okay. That is correct. And then, um, so some of the things that caught my eye on here were AEDs. What, what is, and I mean, some of these were built, bought in 2012. Is there a life expectancy for an AED? There is a life expectancy for an AED. It does go to in service and it won't accept a battery anymore. The batteries get bad and uh, they're just not use, uh, not in good use. It depends on if it's a regular AD, a life pack, depends on the size of the device and what it's being used for. So, yeah. and Mr. Chairman, I thought we swapped those in. I thought we got trade-ins when we have then subsequently bought more in, you know, in the past, I thought we, I thought we got some trade-in value on the so old ones. I thought that's what we did. We, it them. depends on the device. It does, does depend on the, the how big they, if I, it's the life pack, the bigger devices, uh, we do get trading values for those. And but, that was maybe for the ambulances. These look like they're all in our buildings. Yeah, the community centers, the smaller life packs, uh, those type things. So there's no trading value for those. There's minimal okay. trading value. I think I think we can get a little bit out of it, but it's not much. Um, so what do we do? Do we trade them in? Or do, we do we just we write those off, don't we? Oh, we the manufacturer. We have not um, scheduled to replace it yet. There is a plan in the upcoming budget if we decide to go yeah, their route, but they are up for uh, replacement within the next two years. And when we do go out for bid for those, we will include them as a trade-in value. It can normally go from anywhere between 50 to $200. It just depends on the age and if they can sell it to someone else at a reduced rate. So we won't know that until we start going out for quote and know how many we can trade in at are, that time. So are we, are we able to donate those to, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, it'd be great to have these available for- but, No, so, so to that point, those things need annual calibration okay. and, and that's it's associated maintenance costs with those. If we donate them, then we'll have to do the maintenance cost on those as well. So okay. um, I, I get what you're saying. And as Tamika alluded to, we are looking at a system for budget uh, that we've budgeted for this year to help do a 10 year 
keep these things replaced and up to speed and, and cost, save us on the long run is what we're trying to get to. So although this looked like an, a long list of things we we're getting rid of, it, it also seemed plausible uh, for some of the things. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I mean, uh, all the TVs in EOC, for example, I was like, okay, we're upgrading, you know. But um, it looked like there were only three striker stretcher units that were on here. So I, I guess why would there only be three then? Because I'd... Those are our older ones. We okay. have switched to the um, power load system. Yep. So those are in the event that our power load system goes down. We do have extra stretchers to put in and out of the ambulances. So that's so why. So this isn't the power. This isn't the power. So the striker stretcher. On, on, okay. So that's. I thought it was a striker though. Was the power one? It's the manufacturer. So these are just items that are below the five thousand okay. dollar. Um, um, life expectancy. Okay. And so we're just removing them off of the um, asset inventory. So we will still utilize majority, if not all of uh, these items still. Okay. Um, I know um, IT is looking at some of our computers and replacing them, um, but this is just to get them off our inventory. So when we do our audit, they're not looking for those items because they're worth less than $5,000. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Eric, you got anything on item, uh, anything else with the board? Anything, uh, item eight with the uh, revised form agreement for reimbursement of paramedic training program expenses related to EA, EMS in-house paramedic program? Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nine recommendations concerning the scheduling of a public hearing for the Belmont Downstreet Lighting MSBU. Uh, Ten is the recommendation concerning the Northwest District One Advisory Committee, and I think, Madam Attorney, yeah, I, I do prefer that the board include with this a repeal of resolution 2018-63. That's the resolution that instituted this committee. It would be good for the future and the records purposes that we do that. Okay, so clerk can update that. Thank you. Uh, 11 is a, an appointment to the Early Learning Coalition. Uh, car two, uh, recommendation concerning residential rehab grant program funding and lien agreements. Uh, two is cancellation of residential rehab program liens. Three, concerning roof program funding. Four is the issuance of a purchase order for the Bayou Chico Bridge lighting project. Um, I had a question on this though, Claire. It, it looked like it said it was for the um, overhead. I guess what under deck fixtures it says overhead. Why why would F dot not be handling this? Okay, sir. Hey, um, so these are for the the bridge lights themselves, right? That's correct, sir. Okay, so why is F dot not handling it? Um, I'm not sure. I just know that the lights um, we've been paying for them. And so the city has changed out their overhead lights that's on the bridge. And um, so we're basically just trying to up upgrade those to the LED lights. But that's not our bridge, is it? I mean, it's a state road, is it? It is a state road. I mean, that's Barrancas. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So why wouldn't FDOT be paying for it? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I can. Um, I mean, we need All right, see so what we can find out. Ask Christine. Christine. I mean, what we ask that? Christine. Yeah, it was Christine. I mean, who, who, uh, trafficking somebody. It was Joy. Oh, uh, Joy. I, I didn't see her. Else. I mean, Joy. I, I mean, I expect to to handle the Bob Sykes Bridge lighting, but I wouldn't expect to handle the new lighting on the on the you know Chappie James. Well, I have problems on Place Boulevard and Surveying Tees. <laughs> right. I'd, I'd love to put some lights on. And that's a state road, but I've been told I couldn't. We're upgrading the lighting, and the city did do their half of oh. the bridge, which is what they were responsible for. We're responsible but for But why are we half. responsible for, for the lighting on an F dot? We're upgrading it. We wanted to upgrade it why do, but, to LED. Okay. Okay. Say what up, Pam? There's, I mean, we have the opportunity to upgrade. Well, great. I want to upgrade Cervantes and Pace Boulevard. I mean, because we have an opportunity, we don't have a responsibility. Do it because if you're upgrade, there's a difference between adding and upgrading on the state road. I'm sorry. 
No, 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 no. I mean, but it's so, just, so, I mean, but it's so, just like who who made the decision that this yeah, is what I mean, we're going to upgrade? Do it and fund it. I mean, I mean well, we we could fund it right now. It's I mean, that's what we could do is do an CRA animal. district, and we wanted to match. You can choose not to if you don't. So the city did theirs, and because the city did theirs, we felt we needed to do our yeah, side. Yeah, we're not obligated with when the city does something. <laughs> you know, that's not how it works. I, I mean, I understand you want uniformity, and and there's a, I mean, okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do an ad on tonight, then we'll upgrade all the lights on Place Willow and Cervantes, and, and we'll fund it. I mean, come on, that's not, I mean, no, that's... I can identify some funding for that. Okay, well, if so, you'd I mean, like to. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 no one's gotten killed on the bridge. I mean, I guarantee people get killed on Pace Boulevard and Savanties every day. I mean, that's a, that's. Was there a fire vote in your CRA? Excuse me? Was it? No, so, so basically we had funding in, in our budget just for upgrading from, you know, retrofitting um, the hydro, um, sodium pressure lights to LED lights. And this is just part of it, yes. And Mr. Chairman, I'm fine if this is the precedent that we're gonna have, and, and thank you for that clarification, Pam. I'm, we're gonna upgrade. I mean, we're, we're getting into some dangerous territory when we start upgrading uh, amenities on the state road. I mean, that never ends. But I mean, if this is the precedent we're gonna take, then we, we just need to be consistent. And I would expect that my colleagues would be consistent in supporting. I mean, I've had that issue. I mean, we fought hard, you know, to get FDOT to do lights on Tavantes because there was no money to do it, and we were told that we couldn't. And so Pace Boulevard is dark in the state road. And so uh, people getting, we had CO officers trying to get to work that because it was dark and have had tragic accidents right on that road. So uh, I'm fine with it, Mr. Chairman, but Claire, please bring forth the upgrade to lights on Pace Boulevard and Tavantes at the next meeting. Get with the engineer and, and bring it forth. Okay. Uh, five recommendation concerning the issuance of fiscal year 2020 2021 purchase orders in excess of 25000 for parks and recs. Six, derelict vessel removal grant agreement. Seven, derelict vessel grant agreement. And Robert, I, I saw that's for the one right there by the behind the visitor center, right? Uh, that, I think it was that first one. So that's, um, yeah. It just wish we could move on these before they got to the state they were in. Um, eight recommendation concerning contract award for the design services, uh, engineering and design services for 11 Mile Creek stream restoration. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, one second. Uh, Chips, do you mind? And. I apologize not getting with you before we get started this morning, but can we correct the funding sources to identify that we're just going to we're going to utilize the funds that are already allocated on the on the restore side now, the 1.15, and then we can bring that balance back in the future? Is that what I understand we can do? Yes, sir. That $150,000 balance is for future optional tasks okay. that aren't necessary for the engineering design permitting. We'll, we'll okay. get all that done. Uh, that 150,000 is for construction management, which will occur much later. In the actual construction part, in the construction which we part. have other we have other restored funds that are identified for the construction in the future. So w the really the action that we need to take tonight is just related to the 115. That's right. Right. Has that do I need to change that this evening, or has that been changed on the agenda? And forgive me for we, not knowing that. Well, we we would like to still have those optional tasks in the agreement okay because we we want to utilize those later it'll speed up the process and keep right. it on schedule can it be clear that the the financial part of what we're allocating tonight is the 115 though and board any subsequent tasks that exceed the 115 I will bring back to you for where we're going to identify those funds but the likelihood of that is that's uh, probably much further along the path once we get this completed right. which is going to be, be some number of months be, it, yeah, construction will probably be a year from now because okay. uh, the design and permitting right. will take that long. So we can leave the reference to the dollars mm -hmm. in there, but we're not we're not going to be we're not going to be asking for a PO to be issued for those additional dollars. The PO is right. going to cover the, just the one one five. Correct. Okay. All right. So board, just so you know that um, there's not any shenanigans with the one fifty. Perfect. Good, Dwayne. All right, we'll figure it out. She'll come back and watch it and figure it out. All right. Uh, nine recommendation concerning 
LOST, um, and uh, I think this is what was on last time. Yeah, and now uh, I mean, does it? Discussions in the group. Now, Amber, if you don't mind. So has the backup been, have you issued replacement backup that reference it, that is utilizing the email you sent me last night? Yes, sir. That's what is attached. Okay. Well, I don't, I mean, I can't, I don't know what systems we operate in. I, I, I know there are much different systems than they were, say, a year ago, but I don't see what is attached now. So you're saying that what you sent me last night is now the backup for the item? Yes, sir. And I spoke okay. to Don this morning and confirmed that with her. Okay, but can, I, can we get that the, distributed then? Yeah, I mean the emails don't constitute the backup, and I and I'm not. I understand you sent it to me, but the email traffic between us doesn't constitute the backup, and I don't see the backup when so it gets changed like this. So if you're email, telling me it's in, in the, it's in there, okay. The email I sent you yes. was a copy of the backup I downloaded from the the site. Okay, from Super. Civic. Okay, Clark. all right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, that that need to be held tonight for anything. Okay, it does not, correct? Okay, recommendation concerning purchase order in excess of 25,000 for fiscal year 2020-21 for Dell Marketing LP. 11, concerning approval of PD 19-20.091 for psychiatric services with telemed option. 12, concerning the purchase of one 2021. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, Chief sir. Powell. Kind of, morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? C can you kind of explain what that is, what we're doing with that psychiatric? It, it's a continuation of what we've been doing already. It's just a renewal of a contract. Contract, previous contract expired. It went out to bid. Uh, this was the lowest bidder. Actually ended up being the actual provider that was performing the service under another company. Uh, so we're not losing the provider. Uh, she's now just operating with another organization. So this is one person? Yes, sir. And th this person works hand in hand with our mental health counselor within the jail? Directly, yes, sir. So we have our own mental health counselor. Yes, sir. And then we have the psychiatric. Yeah, that's done through a telemed services. She's got a computer at her home. Uh, they literally send an inmate uh, and, and do a telemedicine, if you will, uh, through psych services with, with a psychologist. So this psychologist doesn't come into the jail? No, sir. She, t okay. So she does it virtual. Yes, sir. And then our mental health counseling team interact daily in daily so she writes i guess does she oversee our mental health counselors yeah, how, does, how does it how does it work I, i'm just hey, you just get the microphone yeah. oh, i'm sorry she works hand in hand with them daily uh, uh to to provide uh the the medicines if you will and prescribes from afar uh and they they do the personal counseling with the inmates uh and then she oversees any any medicines that needs to be issued to the individual so she's a certified psychiatrist? Oh, or, full blown, yes, sir. So she's, a, and, and then our mental health counselor who is a psychologist would refer them to the psychiatrist? They're a licensed social worker or a registered social worker that does the counseling aspect of it and she does the medical aspect of it. Uh, upon referrals from, yes, sir. from yes, sir. our medical staff? Okay. And this is just a, a year, that's just basically her year contract. Yes, she, she just operates on the LLC, but she's an individual. Mm -hmm. And she's been working for us for several years now, and we have a great relationship with her and, and serves our, our needs very well. And she does about 30 hours per week? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Beer. Thank you. So this is who was, has been providing the services for us? Yeah, she was working under another company as, as underneath their umbrella, uh, and then she has branched out to... to uh, and put it, I guess, bid for it herself. But she's not who we contracted. She's not who we contracted with before. No, sir. She was How? the actual provider that they hired to perform, perform the services. Uh, is she okay? So we awarded the work to a company that put forth a bid. Do they not identify who's going to be providing the services in the in their bids? No, the other, the other two companies that put in their. their like local tenums is, is a agency that yeah. hires people to fill the needs. Isn't that in essence what this company, the previous company did that we awarded the work to? Yes, sir. Also, she, this, okay. per, this individual was, was the lowest qualified bidder and, and 
ended up being actually the previous provider. I'm, not ta I'm honestly not talking about the item on the agenda today. I'm concerned about the ability for when we make awards to a company or to a person to do work that it's not identified in there who is actually going to be doing the work. And we've had, and the reason I bring this up, we've had issues where there's been, um, you know, we award a contract to company ABC and then they sub out company DEF to do the work. Our contracts, I believe, generally do not allow them to do that without, without notifying us. Allison, is that correct? Well, I'll use the example of our nursing contract. Mr. If you don't mind. Isn't that correct? Yes. They have to notify us and we have to sign off if there's going to be someone different doing the work than the company that the board awarded the work to. Absolutely, unless that was premeditated or uh, set forth in the original, if we had an agreement with them that said okay. that, yes. All right. yeah, I mean, the, the individuals that we contract with, like for our, for our nursing agency, we don't know who the nurse may be. I, under, I understand. No different I, than when that doc came in. They just have to make sure it's provided and we agree once they come to work with us, they meet all our requirements. Okay. I, under, I understand what you're saying, Chief, and I, I don't... I don't, know, I don't know anything, I don't have any issues with the item on the agenda. I don't know anything different or anything to have an issue with. But during the day today, I'm going to ask somebody to go back and look at the previous award to the company where she served as the person that was the provider. Mm -hmm. Because, again, I'm not saying this is this issue, but, Chief, if we have, you know, maybe we have a company that makes a bid to provide, you know, they, they say they're going to provide, um, psychiatric services and then um, we actually begin the work and we're getting work from a psychologist and not a psychiatrist mm -hmm. that's a that's an issue oh absolutely so I want to I want to make sure that if she's who's pro provided the services in the past it, if you're recommending to award it back to her then she probably did a reasonable job yes. but I want to make sure that who we awarded the work to previously where she ended up being the provider that her providing the service met the terms of the board's award to that company, whatever those terms were. Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with okay. that, sir. Well, okay. <laughs> and she filed just for, yes, you know, I mean, mental health is always something that raises my awareness. And so the 115 uh, total expenditures, is that just based on her regular hourly rate? Yes, sir. So, we try not to use utilize them at weeknights and weekends. I mean, because uh, in the price periods that she's on call, contingent upon needs. Um, I mean, if somebody needs a Baker Act and, and, and she's available to, to to assist us with it, uh, if, you know, there, I mean, it, it's a she does all of our Baker Act. No, no, sir. Our, our local services does that, but she's con. Uh, she, again, I don't I don't know the intricacies of their interactions other than they communicate and they work each one of these right. individuals as a caseload. And so if we had the Baker Act, someone, who would sign off and take it to the judge for the judge to sign? Well, it doesn't go to judge. Our, our licensed social workers does paperwork, uh, and then we, we, we process that Baker Act. So if we did some, we, we call that psychiatrist um, on, you know, on a weeknight call. I mean, it can go regular rate 230. Is that, is that the, and then it yes, go sir. up to 750? It, it can get very What would impressive. be an instance in which we would call her? For 750 versus calling her for 230. If we had somebody who had a psychotic break that we couldn't manage locally or at the hospital and, and she's been counseling or working with that individual, if we have to get her engaged with local hospital and they got to start communicating about uh, medicines that, that they're receiving, things of that such. How often does that happen? Not that often, sir. So, so you're saying it, this contract is not to exceed 115? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so it's a 2021 F-150 Super Cab for extension services. 13, concerning the purchase of four 2022 Western Star semi-tractors. Uh, 14, concerning the award of procure for general laboratory services for Eskimo County Waste Services Department. 15, concerning contract award for ECAT fixed route software. Um, Tanya, do you have a quick second? Hey, Tanya, how you doing? I'm doing uh, fine, how are you? Fine, thanks. So will, will this be available for uh, users 
to, to see where buses are and things like that? Yes, sir. This, this is the software that we've been talking about for the last two years. So it will include the ability for the public to see where the buses are, as well as have additional um, access far as, not only that, far as contact um, with ECAT, far as customer service feedback that's in real time through text messages, and as well as our dispatching and scheduling software. Okay. Um, perfect. So, Angela, if you can let whoever know, call, call us, or if they call back, let them know that we're, we had a call earlier today um, asking about, about this. So, um, and then, uh, so just making sure that it, so. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it allows people to see where the buses are and if they're yes, running sir. on time or if they're coming or not or, or, or whatever. Okay. Commissioner Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, how much of an increase is this over what we're paying currently? Um, right now, we do not have the dispatch and scheduling software at all. Um, we are still doing our scheduling by hand. What, what are we doing? What, is, what do we pay double route to do then? I'm sorry, I didn't. Isn't it double route or somebody? Uh, double map. We used to. Double we map. did have double map. However, it did not provide the scheduling piece of it. It only provided the uh, where's my bus. It did that include the additional pieces that this does include? So, so is double map not doing anything for the county now? Um, no, sir, they're not. So we don't have anybody doing any type of any any type of software for the fixed route service. We do have software in our maintenance department, but as far as our dispatching and scheduling, we do not at this moment. So what? How? How much over is? Uh, how much more is this over what it, it had been? Um, this is actually a discount com in comparison to what we've received previously from Double Maps. Double Maps, we only got the where's my bus, and we got to find out where the buses were with the tablet. This includes additional uh, features as far as the automatic voice annunciator, the automatic passenger counter, so we can now see how many people are getting on each um, bus at each time on each stop, whereas before we did not have that capability. This does provide us that capability, as well as provide those additional features. And, but at a lower cost than what? That is correct, yes, sir. Double, okay, that's great. Commissioner Berry, sorry, did you have anything else? Um, no, do hold this for tonight, though. Okay, so hold 16. All right, thank you, Tanya. Thank you. 15. 15, sorry. I already flipped the page. Um, 16 is the State Law Enforcement Trust Fund. Um, I, I did notice that items 7, 8, and 9 didn't have any backup, but. Commissioner Bender, can I explain to you how number eight works? Number eight is their neighborhood cookouts, and I'm glad you brought this up because I'd like some guidance myself. So if you approve a budget, what they're going to do is schedule various neighborhood events. Then we get a flyer and we'll get possibly what they spent on hamburgers or balloons. We get that kind of backup and it's sporadic. It's never at once. It's not just for one event. So when you approve this budget, you just give them a blanket check to do with what they want to do to have their cookouts. Just want you to know that. Um, is, is that true for seven and nine also? That's or those are? Uh, nine, that'll just end up being a check. Autism is out there and you're making, you're approving a contribution to autism in, in Escambia County. Okay, like I said, I just didn't see any backup for seven, eight, nine. We had that same and, conversation. And it seems like it's, okay. We were trying to work on that. I ourselves. also thought it was, it was um, the backup on this was a little, odd um, that um, there's like 100, 182 pages of just various approvals so I, I didn't know if the wrong thing got uploaded or or what but it's um, it says LET applications approved by the BCC I mean it seems like it's most of the ones that we've approved so um, anyway um, I, I didn't again where it stands on on the backup it looks like maybe it had something to do with item b and why we need to appropriate uh, approval uh, appropriate three hundred and three thousand dollars in a sba um so um but it also seems like that account is healthy based on what was included it is yeah. little by little the sheriff's office has conformed to what the bcc has put out there for guidance as to how LETF has spent 
since you all have not really taken any control whatsoever of LETF, you did put in place a process for the sheriff to request a budget or request reimbursement approval. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 17 concerning the locally funded agreement and three party escrow agreement for interstate circle over eight mile Creek bridge replacement project. 18 concerning the ratification of purchase orders issued in excess of $25,000 related to Hurricane Sally for engineering department. 19 concerning approval of expenses through CARES Act funding program. Uh, I think I see Michael Caps back there. Um, so it looks like we have another twelve thousand coming uh, for the the PPP and th PPE and things that you bought for the for the um, base center. Um, so uh, as as we learned in our last meeting, uh, Michael's taken over at the base center, and um, uh, as of uh, Tuesday, I think it was, and uh, we'll have a transition period with with Cindy for a few months, and then. Uh, the training wheels come off, but I think he could, uh, he'd probably be ready to do it now. So, um, anyway, happy to see you and, uh, congratulations. Uh, okay. Uh, recommendation concerning the appointment for the district one medical examiner. Um, two concerning the discussion, which we've already had for the, um, DPZ. And so that will, um, just be dropped tonight. Um, and then the county attorney report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first oh, item, sure. the first item has to do uh, with uh, you've seen this item once before in a <coughs> previous related uh, action, but this is to accept the indemnity and defense related to an incident out on the pier at the beach. The uh, tenants insurance company will be responsible for that. Item number two, I have been dropped, I asked to drop the item related to the Lakeview. Is that, I hadn't heard that, so is that, um, I, 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 I've talked to Mark, and I don't know if it's time sensitive, but um, we're having some discussions, um, and I'm gonna have some more discussions with Baptist and Lakeview. Okay. And bring it back. And item number three really should be a discussion item. It will need a separate vote, but this is a request that we discuss the status of the employment contract with the county administrator. Should the board wish to schedule that for June the 17th, I would need an actual vote of the board to do that. Okay. Then we've got a request regarding the release of mineral rights for property previously owned by the county. The state statute does allow you to do that. Um, and that's a thing. Why, why would we though? Most, most of these things, they, you never get it released. So why, why would, what would be, would that be in our interest to do it? Um, you ha that's, so under state statute, typically the mineral rights are gonna remain with the county commission. I think that that dates back to the days when they didn't want the public to get ripped off if oil was later found or something like that. Uh, you actually have occasionally done some of these. We had one for Mr. Homiak not that long ago. So occasionally you'll get a developer or somebody who fears or feels as though this affects the title of the property or they're wanting to either purchase, develop, or transfer a property and they're running into issues with maybe their financing company or something because of the title issues. I think you just have to weigh out what's the use of holding on to them. Is there any chance that there's anything there of value? And if, if not, you could certainly offer to sell them. Yeah. That's an option as well. If, if there is, we shouldn't have sold the property. Well, right. Well. <laughs> right. I, I just was curious because I've seen these before where you, when you buy a house in a subdivision, you specifically are told you don't own the mineral rights. They're right. still owned by, you know, Scooby-Doo or whoever. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, so why would we give it away? This, this is, it is related to a, uh, to economic development project. Right. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's some ration, there's some rationale to, right. to the request coming forward. No, no problem. So you have no, no issue with the commissioner here? No. I mean, no, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And then the last item on the county attorney's report is the request of Commissioner Barry that we discuss the county's local annuity program. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. 
Uh, we are adjourned until our shade meeting at 4 o'clock. <laughs>